This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 199th edition of the program. We are one away from 200. And today is Friday, June 28th. And before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the first time to support us this week or increased their monthly pledge. And that includes Ali Nakfi, Carlos Osorio, Demond Moy, Dork Sighted, D. Ragland, Grant Scarborough, Manda Slinker, Rostifer Geller, Sam O, oh, C.R. Hai Shanchenka, Suzanne Harris, and Trevor Thompson. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support or by checking out patreon.com forward slash humanistreport or as usual, you can click join beneath under uh, or underneath any one of our YouTube videos uh, and support us that way as well. So let's get into the episode. I don't know why anyone would want to watch this today because Super Mario Maker just came out and um, that looks awesome. But regardless, if you're here, let's talk politics. So this week on the Humanist Report podcast, Bernie Sanders that wants to cancel all of your student loan debt and some people aren't too happy about that so we'll talk about the counter arguments to this plan and there's a number of progressives in congress that also want to cancel your student loan debt also bernie sanders evidently wants the media to take war with iran more seriously joe biden is oddly the number one choice for climate-minded voters we'll talk about that also trump has been credibly accused of rape he also wants a new deal with Iran. We'll talk about both of the Democratic Party debates, night one with Tulsi Gabbard and Elizabeth Warren, as well as night two with Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today. Hopefully you guys will enjoy the show. Let's do it. Bernie Sanders has pretty much led the charge when it comes to making public colleges and universities tuition free. And I've always commended him for that. However, with that being said, even if you make public colleges and universities tuition free, that doesn't ameliorate the crisis that already unfolded. Like there's currently 45 million people that have more than 1.5 trillion in total student loan debt. So you've got to do something more for those people. And previously his plan, in my view, wasn't good enough. Like it was really milk toast. He wanted to cap the repayments to 10, 12%, something along those lines. And I've always tried to encourage him to go further. But thankfully, he listened to me. He listened to all of us who have been begging him to take things to the next level. He has a plan now that is phenomenal for student loan debt. He's going to cancel all of it, full stop. We will make a full and complete education a human right in America to which all of our people are entitled. This means making public colleges, universities, and HBCUs tuition free and debt free by tripling the work study program, expanding Pell Grants, and other financial incentives. Today we are entering a proposal which will allow every person in this country to get all of the education that they need to live out their dreams because they are Americans. Further, in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, it is simply not acceptable that our younger generation, through no fault of their own, will have a lower standard of living than their parents, more debt, lower wages, and less likelihood of owning their own homes. That is why this proposal completely eliminates student debt in this country and ends the absurdity of sentencing an entire generation, the millennial generation, to a lifetime of debt for the crime of doing the right thing, and that is going out and getting a higher education. Ten years ago, <clears throat> The United States government bailed out Wall Street after their greed, their recklessness, and their illegal behavior drove us into the worst recession in modern history. Today, 
the major Wall Street banks are larger than ever, their profits are soaring, and their CEOs receive huge compensation packages. Our proposal, which costs $2.2 trillion over 10 years, will be fully paid for by a tax on Wall Street speculation similar to what exists in dozens of countries around the world. The American people bailed out Wall Street. Now it is time for Wall Street to come to the aid of the middle class of this country. Okay, this is proof that Bernie Sanders, strategically speaking, he knows what he's doing. Because when Elizabeth Warren announced that she'd be canceling some student loan debt, what I said in the video when I talked about that was that this was a phenomenal plan. However, since Elizabeth Warren isn't in favor of canceling all student loan debt, she left him enough room to where he can swoop in and still do better than her. And this is what I said. If I'm even considering Elizabeth Warren's plan, if I were Elizabeth Warren, I'd say we're going to cancel 100% of student loan debt. That $1.5 trillion, we're deleting all of it. Because you won't actually get that but when you negotiate, you'll negotiate down to something that she's actually aiming for. So I would go bolder and Elizabeth Warren just outflanked Bernie from the left, but she left him enough room to where he can still top her on this particular issue. And he did just that. So this tells me that Bernie Sanders' political instincts are absolutely on point. And I am so glad because think about this. If you had your student loan debt canceled, what would that mean for you? Like for me, this would be literally life changing. For so many people who can't buy cars, they can't buy houses, this would change their lives. So I'm 100% on board, and what I want you all to do is encourage your representative to co-sponsor this legislation in the House, because Bernie Sanders teamed up with uh, progressives such as Ilhan Omar, who is the sponsor of this bill in the House, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Ocasio-Cortez, and they're leading the charge. But what we need to do now as progressives is do the same thing that we did when it comes to Medicare for All. We need to get other lawmakers to get on board with this. But now what I want to do is I want to talk about the response to this, because the counter-arguments that I've seen are hilarious. Like, I'm genuinely enjoying them. They're pure gold. Because it's evident to me that nobody knows how the fuck to attack this plan without sounding like elitist pricks. And I'm living for it. So, for example, Wall Street Defense Force, otherwise known as Third Way, which is the Wall Street-funded wing of the Democratic Party, they tweeted this out. Free college for all is regressive. Blanket debt forgiveness could actually increase inequality. Sure, Jan. Now, when you look at the ratio here, you'll see that people absolutely were just shredding Third Way because this is nonsense. They're literally trying to convince you that this is going to do the opposite of what it's supposed to do. So their argument, if we accept their logic for a moment, is that this is going to increase income and wealth inequality. Now I know what you're thinking. How can we even accept that logic because it doesn't make sense? I hear you, but just hear me out for a second. Let's say we believe their nonsensical attack on this. How on earth could this possibly lead to inequality? Well, you see, it's simple. If you cancel all student loan debt, including the student loan debt of rich people, then this is another handout in the same way that Donald Trump's tax cuts for the rich was a brazen handout to the rich. So if you cancel everyone's debt, if you just blanket forgive all student loans, including the loans of rich people, then what do you think that's going to do? That's going to really help rich people as well as poor people. And I found a tweet that I think is pretty sympathetic to this line of thinking. This is from Amy Vanderpool, who says, I don't want to pay off student loan debt for rich people who can afford it. We should be selective in solving this problem. That is the only way to grow the middle class. Warren's plan has a way to do that. Bernie's does not. Wrong. So if you accept that line of thinking, then the idea is, well, you know, maybe we should go with a more incrementalist approach here. If we're going to forgive student loan debt, maybe we should make it a means-tested program. Maybe we should go with Elizabeth Warren's plan. Because I don't think it's right for rich people to get any more handouts. Except there's one flaw with that line of thinking. If you're rich, you don't need to take out a student loan. Why would you take out a loan if you don't need it when you know you'd have to pay interest? See, the problem is 
this doesn't make sense because rich people don't get student loans. As Benjamin Dixon puts it, this is almost as stupid as people being against increasing the minimum wage to $15 because it's going to increase the price of a Big Mac. Rich people don't take out loans and the price of Big Macs have gone up even when wages didn't. Exactly. It's not a handout for the rich because rich people don't need student loans. So that line of thinking is flawed. And quite frankly, it's idiotic. So that was the first counter argument that I came across. You know, this helps rich people and that's bad, so we shouldn't do it. So what is counter argument number two? Well, it's basically the opposite. We shouldn't do this because it hurts the rich and that's bad. Not making this up. As this tweet from Bloomberg points out, Wall Street says Bernie Sanders student loan debt plan could bring more pain for investors through higher fees or lower returns. <laughs> Goddamn right. So rich investors on Wall Street would subsequently get less money in the event we canceled student loan debt. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Forgive me for uh, not really caring, but they care and they're pretty broken up about this. In fact, here at The Humanist Report, we have obtained exclusive footage of the rich reacting to Bernie Sanders' plan. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not going to really explore this argument too much because if it is true that canceling student loan debt is a zero-sum game and, you know, by doing that, poor Americans gain something and rich Americans lose something, then, um, good. But moving on, there's one last argument that I want to touch on here, and this is the what about me argument, as I like to call it, because if you're someone who paid off your student debt, you, you know, you accumulated a lot of debt through student loans, but you worked hard enough and you paid it off. What about you? I mean, we can all kind of empathize with this. I know the people who bought Fallout 76 last year probably felt buyer remorse when just weeks later on Black Friday it went on sale for 50% off. And even then, you know, it was still too much money because it was a broken, buggy piece of shit. And it still is. But the question is, is this unfair to people who paid off their student loans? Well, let's hear from someone who actually did work really hard to pay off their student loan debt. This is an op-ed from Vox written by David Goldstein, and he explains, I graduated college in 1985 with $18,000 in student loans, about $42,500 in 2019 dollars, and then diligently paid them off over the next 10 years. As a father, I saved enough for my daughter's education to assure that she could graduate college 100% debt-free. I'm not rich. I didn't always make the best financial choices, but I worked hard, played by the rules, and made good on my debts. I could be the poster child for those claiming student loan forgiveness is quote-unquote unfair, but you know what's really unfair? The huge advantage I enjoyed graduating into the 1985 job market. I graduated with a BA in history, not the most valuable field of study when it comes to job qualifications, but when I entered the job market in 1985, employers were eager to hire smart kids from good universities, whatever their degree. I got the first and only job I applied for, a cushy tech job I knew absolutely nothing about, at a starting salary of $35,000 per year. That's 82000 in today's money. So let's just pause right there. Contrast that job market with today's job market. If you just graduated college, the odds of you landing a good paying job on your first try, almost impossible. It's unfathomable, right? And even if you did land a good job, you were lucky enough to get a job because you have a degree, you still wouldn't be able to pay off your student loan debt that quickly. You'd still have it until the day you die because you need more student loans because the cost of tuition has skyrocketed. Completely different economies. When this person was young, that was a different era, economically speaking, where you could, you know, graduate, pay off your debt relatively quickly, and get a job, and it's easier to pay off debt if you could find a good paying job, but these days, kids graduate college, and they have to work for Uber. They get jobs at Starbucks because there's just not enough jobs that are good paying to go, to go around. You end up in the service industry. So the economy is different, but he also goes through a little bit more as to why it's not unfair 
to cancel student loan debt of people today. He states, whenever an old white guy like me reminds you that I worked my way through college, remind them that in the 1981 to 1982 academic year, the average in-state tuition and fees at a four-year public college or university was just $909 back when the federal minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. That means I could have paid for my entire freshman year tuition and fees with less than seven weeks of full-time minimum wage work at just about any shitty summer job. But over the past four decades, average public university tuition and fees have increased more than 11-fold to $10,230 a year, while the federal minimum wage of $7.25 an hour has barely doubled. So why have public universities gotten so expensive? It's not what you probably think. Adjusted for inflation, the cost of educating students at public universities has actually increased only modestly. Rather, it's the price that's gone through the roof, thanks in large part to a massive shift in costs from taxpayers to students. According to the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, student tuition as a share of total spending at our nation's public colleges and universities rose from 24% in 1988 to 46% in 2015. And in some states, this shift in costs has been far worse. In my adopted state of Washington, once home to one of the most affordable public university systems in the nation, the funding split dramatically flipped from 70% state 30% tuition in 1991 to 30% state, 70% tuition by 2013. Boomers like me have pulled up the ladder behind us after being educated largely at taxpayer expense. No wonder young people have piled up more than $1.5 trillion in student debt. So yes, as a late-wave boomer with absolutely nothing to gain from Sanders or Warren's plans, I enthusiastically support both student loan debt forgiveness and debt-free college, not just because it would be damn good for the economy, but giving a whole generation saddled by debt more freedom to build up savings, buy homes, and contribute to the economy, but because... I believe in the golden rule, give unto future generations the same opportunities and privileges my generation enjoyed. So that's from someone who paid off his student debt, who is rejecting this idea that it is unfair to forgive all the student loan debt of people who currently have it. But let's say, hypothetically speaking, you're a millennial and you worked really hard and you just paid off your student loan debt last week and here... You're seeing stories about how Bernie Sanders wants to cancel student loan debt. First of all, by our student loan debt being canceled, that doesn't necessarily mean that we gain something at your expense. All that Sanders is doing here is helping us out of a ditch. He's giving us a hand. And even if Bernie Sanders helps us out of that ditch, you're still going to be better off than all of us, if that's really what you care about, which you shouldn't care about because human empathy should be our number one concern. But I mean, if you were lucky enough to pay off your student loan debt, you're already better off than people who currently have student loan debt. It's like me saying, well, you know what? I had to accumulate all of this student loan debt, so my nieces and nephews shouldn't get free college because I didn't get it. That's not the way that society functions by them getting their debt canceled you don't lose anything in fact you gain something because that increases purchasing power of people who are burdened by debt that stimulates the entire economy everyone benefits from it but even if this argument isn't persuasive to you well that doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't do it even if you think it's unfair just because you think it's unfair doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it Don't you think that we should be helping people? I mean, if you're angered at this, but didn't say anything when we bailed out Wall Street, think about your priorities. So there's really no persuasive argument against student loan debt cancellation. However, I absolutely love watching people try to make it and then fumble, face plant, you know, just hilariously, because this is something that would be a benefit to everyone, not just those of, you know, the beneficiaries of student loan debt cancellation. This would benefit the aggregate economy, which helps all of us. Bernie Sanders has received a tremendous amount of credit and attention for his student loan debt cancellation plan, and rightfully so. You know, it's well-deserved because this is something that doesn't just help Americans. Like, you wouldn't just 
fundamentally change people's lives for the better by canceling their student loan debt, but you're also helping to shift the Overton window to the left, which is desperately needed in this day and age. However, I want to take some time here to spotlight the legislative allies that make this possible because Bernie Sanders can introduce as many bills as he wants to in the Senate. But if you don't have an ally in the House of Representatives that will co-introduce this legislation, it's going to basically be dead on arrival. And there's a lot of people who are key players here who I also want to take some time to highlight because what they're doing is absolutely phenomenal. So the bill is HR 3448. It's sponsored by Ilhan Omar and co-sponsored by Pramila Jayapal, Rashida Tlaib, Barbara Lee, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And not only have these individuals co-sponsored this legislation, but they also made a really powerful case as to why we should cancel student loan debt. First, I want to show you Ilhan Omar and what she had to say, because what she said here, honestly, it gave me chills. It's so powerful. It's so profound that I, I just I had to share it. I stand before you on behalf of 45 million Americans, 45 million people who feel they can't purchase their first home, 45 pe million people who feel like they can't start a family, 45 million people who have dreams of opening up a business or going to public service but are held back by a mountain of debt. We are told going to college opens a world of opportunity, but far too many it's accompanied by a world of anxiety, stress, and never-ending debt. We are told by some politicians that this debt is our fault. That if we want to achieve the American dream, we have to lift ourselves up by our bootstraps. Well, we're here today to say the student debt is not the result of bad choices or behavior. It is the result of a system that tells the students to get an education and go to college in order to have a stable life but then does not provide the resources to afford that education. The scourge of student debt does not affect all Americans equally. The students of color face a higher risk of defaulting on their loans and struggle to find jobs to pay off these loans due to discriminatory hiring practices. First generation and immigrant college students face much higher rates of default and women who already face a wage gap and workplace discrimination owe two-thirds of a total student loan debt. What my bill does is simple as it is revolutionary, as Senator Sanders says. It cancels all of 1.6 trillion student loan debt. No exceptions, no questions asked, full cancellation. Americans will no longer wonder if they can buy a home or start a family or open a business or retire. America does not suffer from scarcity, we suffer from greed. So we can ask the speculators on Wall Street to pay small financial transaction tax, which would fully fund student loan forgiveness over 10 years. The American people bailed out Wall Street. It's time for Wall Street to bail out the American people. Ilhan Omar is a national treasure. I absolutely love her. Um, that was great. And what she's saying is true. Like, this is going to change people's lives. If you were spending $900 a month on student loans, guess what? Now you might be able to afford a mortgage. Now you might be able to afford a car payment. I mean, this really is a game changer for a lot of people. It's going to pull people out of poverty in some ways. And... The fact that there are people who are fighting for it and being vocal about it, that really is inspiring. We are changing the country slowly but surely. You know, we're shifting the Overton window. So that was what Ilhan Omar said. I want to show you what AOC says because she also made the case and she made a very powerful case for it. That alone illustrates it. Because what we tell 17-year-olds all the time is that you are not old enough or responsible enough to drink. You are not old enough or responsible enough to vote. You are not old enough or responsible enough to serve in our military. But you are old enough and responsible enough to take on a quarter million dollars worth of debt. And that is wrong. It is not right. 
not only is that what we are telling uh, children now, minors now, but that's what we have told them for decades. And it has resulted in a crisis that we have seen today. Now people are in their 30s and, and older that have taken on insurmountable amounts of debt because we have sold them an empty bill of goods. And what we need to do is make it right. And that is why we have to both make public colleges tuition free and forgive all student loan debt at the same time. So that was absolutely great. And as usual, I agree with everything she had to say. Now, I've talked about some of the counter arguments that we've seen when it comes to people saying, you know, we shouldn't cancel student loan debt because reasons X, Y, and Z. They're all bullshit reasons. But we all know what Third Way thinks about this. They say that free college is quote unquote regressive, which is hilarious. And they say that blanket debt forgiveness could actually increase inequality. Well, here's what AOC had to say about that. It's wild to think that Third Way has gotten along with its sensible dem charade as long as it has. I've met Trump voters, independent voters, but I can't recall a single voter I've met in the United States that identifies as a Third Way voter. Just admit, you're a Wall Street advocacy group and move on. <laughs> That's so true. Nobody identifies as Third Way. Who does? This group is comprised of beneficiaries of Wall Street campaign contributions. Many of them just came from Wall Street straight up. So Third Way is a joke, but yet they're taken seriously. They're taken to be this, you know, this sensible wing of the Democratic Party that's more moderate, but they're not moderate. They don't really have a core political ideology. They're not left right. They're pro Wall Street. That's what they are. These are the quintessential corporate Democrats who progressives have been fighting against. So the fact that anyone takes them seriously is absurd, and quite frankly, it's an abomination. But the good news is that not many people take them seriously. Go to their Twitter feed. Almost every single one of their tweets are ratioed. If it goes viral, it's because they were ratioed. Now, that's not to say that people in mainstream media don't take them seriously, but that's something that we expect because corporate media has advertisers that also happen to donate to members of Third Way. So that's not surprising at all. They're all in bed with the same people. You know, it's a big circle that we're all not a part of. But with that being said, the way that AOC and progressive Democrats like Bernie Sanders keep shitting on Third Way, it's giving me life. I, I'm absolutely loving it. So this is what we need to do whenever this this type of legislation i think that positive reinforcement is incredibly powerful because it's really easy to be cynical and only focus on the negative and the bad whenever you know a lawmaker fucks us over or does something corrupt or stupid or duplicitous but when lawmakers do things that are good i think we also need to take the time and commend them for it because understand that if you come out in favor of something like canceling student loan debt you're going to be a target of wall street third way immediately attack this if you come out in favor of something that helps the people, but it's to the detriment of a special interest, like Medicare for All, for example, you make yourself a target. So to the people like Ilhan Omar, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Bernie Sanders, of course, who make themselves targets of special interests, I think we need to go out of our way to applaud them whenever they continue to fight for us in spite of the attacks. Because if everyone else is too afraid and only a select handful of people like Barbara Lee, Pramila Jayapal are willing to fight for us, then less people in Congress will be inclined to act. Now, we shouldn't have to hold their hands and put pressure on them. They should just instinctively want to do the right thing and represent their constituents. But of course, you know, that's not the real world. So we have to make sure that our lawmakers do the right thing. That's incumbent on us. So we've got to do two things. We need to definitely have positive reinforcement to make sure that people like uh, Ilhan Omar and AOC know that we are pleased with their performance, but we also need to put pressure on those who aren't speaking out. Now, how do we do this? Well, it's easy. You just call your lawmaker, call your representative, and tell him or her to co-sponsor this legislation. I'm going to lead by example and call my representative, Su Suzanne Bonamici. Her number is 202 225 0855 and please don't call my representative call your representative because if we all just call one representative that's not going to really make a difference but if you call the person who's representing you specifically then your voice matters or at least it should matter and even if they reject 
what you want them to do. What matters is that you get the word across. You vocalize your desires as someone who is the boss of these politicians. So I'm going to call the bill is HR 3448. Let's do for this bill what we did to HR 676 back in 2017. Verizon Wireless, your call can now be completed as dialed. Please. And I just dialed the wrong number. 202 225 0855. Thank you for contacting the office. Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, representing Oregon's 1st Congressional District. Our office hours are 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. when Congress is in session and 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. when in recess. At the beat, please leave a detailed message including your contact information. Alternatively, you can contact the local district office at 503-469-6010. Thank you. Record your message after the tone. When you've finished, you can hang up or press 1 for more options. Hello, my name is Mike Figueredo. I'm calling with a message for Representative Bonamici. I just would like her to co-sponsor uh, legislation HR 3448. This is legislation sponsored by Representative Ilhan Omar, and it would cancel all student loan debt. As someone with a tremendous amount of student loan debt myself, it would really mean a lot to me if my representative who serves me in Congress would put her name on this legislation because that tells me that you're looking out for me and you're definitely trying to fight to improve uh, my life and the life, uh, the lives of other people. So I would really appreciate it if she co-sponsored HR three four four eight. Thank you. And look, it's as simple as that. A lot of people tell me that they often feel intimidated. You know, they don't like calling people. First of all. Nine times out of ten, you're just going to leave a message. Uh, second of all, there's no perfect way to say anything. Like, you don't need a script for yourself. You just tell them what's on your mind. If you have a bill name or, or a bill number, that's going to make things easier. But there's no perfect way to do this. Understand that you are the boss of your representative. You pay uh, the bills for them, right? Your tax dollars are going into their paychecks. They are your subordinates. So you need to realize the power that you have and exercise it. Call them and let them know that you want them to co-sponsor this legis legislation that would cancel student loan debt. It's that simple. Um, you don't have to word it perfectly. You can stumble over your words. We're all human beings. It's not scary. You know, just just do it. And once you make one call, I promise you after that, future calls are less intimidating and less scary. I've never really worried about making calls to Congress people because I have a big mouth and I am not afraid to share my opinion. But understand that it's not anything to be worried about. So, uh we need to make sure that if lawmakers keep doing things like this and proposing these types of phenomenal pieces of legislation, that we let people know in power that we want to see more of this. And you do that with positive reinforcement and by getting your representative to get on board with this. And I'll leave that there. Over the weekend, we almost went to war with Iran. We were this close. Donald Trump had his finger on the trigger but he decided not to pull it at the very last minute. Think about how crazy, how terrifying that is. Now, the reason reportedly why Donald Trump had a change of heart is because he was talked out of it by Tucker Carlson of Fox News, of all people. The world that we live in, like, it's stranger than fiction. Reality is literally stranger than fiction. Now, Trump tweeted about this and he said, we were cocked and loaded to retaliate last night on three different sites when I asked how many will die. 150 people, sir, was the answer from a general. Ten minutes before the strike, I stopped it. Now, he also explained that he didn't think, you know, bombing these three different sites was a proportionate response to them just killing one of our robots. Now, he's correct about that. And whatever led him to make that decision, I'm glad it happened. However... This is a very unstable time, not just in American politics, but internationally. If we have someone that came that close to bombing Iran, war with Iran, sorry, you shouldn't be in that position. There was, you know, a meme of Donald Trump giving himself a medal of honor or something like that because, you know, he was going to bomb Iran, but then he didn't. So he's trying to make it seem like he's the hero. 
no, you're not the hero. You don't get to congratulate yourself for putting out a fire that you started. You don't get to do that. Tensions would have never been this high had you remained in the Iran nuclear deal. But because you decided that you didn't like a deal because Obama is the one who negotiated it, then you got us to this point, gradually. So, we were that close to war. That is incredibly difficult to fathom, but nonetheless, it happened. And part of the problem, part of the reason why we don't see more reluctance from our leaders to get involved in these types of conflicts is because mainstream media does not push back. So I'm going to play an interview for you. And this is a clip from Face the Nation with Bernie Sanders. Now, Bernie Sanders is going to say everything right pretty much here. But what I want you to really pay attention to is the framing here. Because the framing is what I'm concerned about. This is a failure on behalf of media. Take a look. I want to ask you uh, about Iran. Good. Was President Trump's decision this week to call off that strike the right one? <laughs> See, it's like somebody setting a fire uh, to uh, a basket full of paper and then putting it out. Uh, he helped create the crisis and then he stopped the attacks. The idea that we're looking at a president of the United States who, number one, thinks that a war with Iran is something that might be good for this country. He was just doing a limited strike. Oh, just a limited strike. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I just didn't know that it's okay to simply attack another country with bombs, just a limited strike. That's an act of warfare. So two points. That will set off a conflagration all over the Middle East. Uh, and if you think the war, as I do, the war in Iraq, Margaret, was a disaster. I believe from the bottom of my heart that the war, a war with Iran would be even worse, more loss of life, never ending war in that region, massive instability. We're talking about, we have been in uh, Afghanistan now for 18 years. This thing will never end. So I will do everything I can, number one, to stop a war with Iran. And number two, here's an important point. You know, let's remember what we learned in civics, you know, when we were kids. It is the United States Congress under our Constitution that has mm -hmm. war-making authority, not the President of the United States. If he attacks Iran, in my view, that would be unconstitutional. So if you are Commander-in-Chief, you will ask Congress for permission yes. before you engage in any kind no, of military no. action? Look, there are some times of, of, of emergency situations. Okay, that, that I understand. Defensive actions. Yeah, if you're attacked immediately, you have to respond. Nobody believes that we are in that type of emergency situation with Iran right now. Now, the sad part is that I only found out about this clip because Bernie Sanders was being attacked. He was the one being attacked because he was apparently uh, rude to that reporter because he scoffed at the question that she asked. If you don't scoff at that type of question... You're just, you're not a reasonable person. She said, oh, it was just a limited strike. I mean, what she did there was try to justify it. A limited strike, that was an act that would have been an act of war. Can you imagine if Iran did a limited strike on the United States? Or if North Korea did a limited strike on the United States? We wouldn't take that very lightly. We would consider it an act of war, and rightly so, because that's an act of war. Now, the thing about these CBS News reporters is that they must be trained to say things like this. They are trained, presumably, to play devil's advocate. But the problem is that if you're going to play devil's advocate for something like war, you need to make it explicitly clear that that's what you're doing. You're playing devil's advocate. You're saying, you know, or you should say, rather, what do you say to people who say X? Not just, oh, it was just the limited strike. Because even if maybe that reporter was playing devil's advocate, it still makes you look really stupid. Because it makes it seem like you're doing pro-war apologia, which the mainstream media should not be doing. The mainstream media's job is to educate people. Tell them objective facts about war. If we go to war, this is the cost. This is the monetary cost. This is the human life cost. This is what would happen in terms of destabilization. Here's experts one, two, and three to tell us why this would be a disaster. But they don't do that. They're doing pro-war apologia. This is why this book, Manufacturing Consent, is one of the best books. Because it explains how corporate media 
is almost worse than state-sponsored media outlets, right? You, you know, these authoritarian regimes, they have state-run outlets, and we all condemn that because that's authoritarianism. You need, you know, an objective, independent media. But I mean, we have corporate media under our capitalist system, and we effectively get a press that is collectively more loyal to the state than some state-run media outlets in authoritarian regimes. It's absurd. Now, what the reporter then goes on to do is try and goad Bernie Sanders into saying that Iran is at fault here. But thankfully, Bernie Sanders doesn't take the bait. When you said it was President Trump's fault that this situation evolved, don't you hold Iran responsible? Yes, I do too. But what, what Trump has said, he said it during his campaign, Trump has been extraordinarily antagonistic uh, with Iran, whether or not he wants to bring down their government I don't know. I think people like John Bolton may very well uh, want to do that. Uh, Trump is the person you remember who withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal. So he has been, without any, I don't think anyone disagrees, an extraordinarily provocative toward Iran uh, and loving the dictatorship in Saudi Arabia. That's so not the role that we should be playing. How would President Sanders resolve this? I'll tell you how we would. Look, this is a tough issue, and I'm not saying it's anyone can easily resolve but this is what I would say. I would say to Iran, I would say to Saudi Arabia, I would say to Israel, I would say to the other countries in that region, you know what? You have been at war in one way or another for decade after decade after decade. And by the way, your wars have not only impacted your own people, they have impacted the United States to the tune of trillions of dollars and 5,000 lost lives. We will play a role in bringing you together. And if you need economic aid, we will provide the economic aid. We will provide the resources, but we're not simply going to give more and more weaponry to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Israel. We're going to try to bring people together for what I admit, Margaret, I admit it, will not be easy. But that's what the role of, I think, the U.S. should be, not simply to be uh, part of the uh, Saudi uh, war efforts in the region. So again, everything that Bernie Sanders said there was great. He talks about how it's Donald Trump who has been antagonistic. He talks about how, you know, John Bolton wants regime change in Iran. But the reason why I play that clip for you is because it really demonstrates how the media is incorrectly portraying the situation. Don't you hold Iran responsible? Isn't it unfathomable to think that the United States could ever be wrong? I mean, we are the aggressors. We violated the Iran deal. We pulled out and reimposed sanctions. Iran came to the table and they agreed to a deal that nobody thought they would have agreed to because it was so strong. And then we pull out inexplicably, you know, once we get a new president and now we're reimposing these sanctions. How do you frame that as anything but the United States being the aggressor? Objectively speaking, you report the facts. This is how the United States unilaterally got us to this point by poking and poking do they even stop to ask, why were we flying so close to Iran to begin with? We may or may not have been in international airspace. Maybe we crossed into Iranian airspace. But regardless, why are we over there? If not to intimidate Iran. So that's a huge problem with media. They're not portraying things accurately. And they go out of their way to make sure that the United States is portrayed in the most charitable way possible. You know, we're never the bad guys. If we do something, it's good by default because we're the good guys. Our intentions are pure, of course. No, that's not actually the case. But getting to CBS, they constantly do things like this, and they don't realize that it is crushing their legitimacy. Because if you'll recall, a couple of months ago on CBS This Morning, I critiqued a CBS reporter who said something as equally idiotic while presumably playing devil's advocate when it comes to healthcare. Take a look. The president wants his party to be the party of health care. Unfortunately, apparently, what he means by that is throwing 32 million Americans off of the health insurance they have. I but don't isn't know. that what your plan would do, too? Because you'd what be you? moving them into Medicare for all? I mean, if they have insurance right now. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a second. The president's plan, and what he has supported, throws 32 million people off of health care. No alternative. We provide health care to every man, woman, and child in this country. I think maybe slightly different concepts. We guarantee health care to all. He throws 32 million off of health care. Off of the affordable slightly care different. Act. Off of the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And they have no alternative. That reporter, also from CBS, 
framed Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan, which extends healthcare to 100% of the population, as people losing healthcare. So it's probably the case that these reporters aren't that stupid. I hope, right? I, I hope that they're not that dumb. But what they're probably doing is they're taking orders from higher ups. They're probably trained to play devil's advocate in order to appear more neutral. I don't know what the reason is, but here's what I do know. The media's job is to educate people, give us the information that we need to make informed decisions in life, at the voting booth. Your job is to educate. And this clip is evidence that they are failing to do their job because if the media was doing its job, millions of Americans would be in the streets right now screaming about war with Iran and what a disaster that would be. But because the United States isn't being portrayed correctly, because it seems as if Iran is the aggressor, well then, of course, any and everything that we do is justified. Because again, we're the good guys. This is a problem with corporate media. This is a problem with corporate media. And we've got to point it out because this is absolutely dangerous. When it comes to war, there's no room for you to play devil's advocate, especially if you're not going to be explicitly clear about the fact that that's what you're doing, if that's what you're doing. But your job is to educate. Now do your job before you get us all killed. We've got a problem on our hands. We've got a really big problem on our hands. And by the time this video is over, this is going to be the look on your face. Because I don't really even know how to respond to this. Because we always hear, you know, about how voters are inclined to vote against their own self-interest, but I think that what this story demonstrates more so than anything is that people are knowingly doing this. They think that they are voting for what's in their best interest, but in actuality, they're just horribly, horribly misinformed. So what am I talking about? Well, as Rebecca Peich of The Hill reports, former Vice President Joe Biden is the top choice for president among likely Democratic voters who are focused on the climate, according to a new poll. The online poll released Monday as a collaboration between the Sierra Club and Morning Consult limited its results to voters who said candidates' plans for the climate are an important factor in their vote, while Biden would be the top choice for 37% of climate-minded voters Senators Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren came in second and third with 19% and 15% respectively. The results echo other national polls of Democrats, which have largely found Biden far ahead of Sanders and Warren, with the senators in a tough fight for second place. So the trend with this question is that it mirrors just national polls. People think, oh, well, because I support Joe Biden, um, that must mean that he's also good when it comes to the issue of climate change, because I care deeply about this issue of climate change. It's people kind of imposing what they think Joe Biden stands for when they clearly have not done their research. Because Joe Biden, factually speaking, is not the best on climate change. In fact, he was one of the worst until recently, because Greenpeace gave him a D-minus rating alongside John Hickenlooper, and he's just above Bill Weld and Donald Trump. This is how they ranked Joe Biden back in May. However, after taking quite a bit of criticism because you can't run to be the Democratic Party nominee and do this bad on the issue of climate change, well, he did decide to change his views a little bit, and this did give him a bump after he released a new climate change plan. So as of today, after gauging candidates' answers to a 29-question survey that Greenpeace had uh, sent out to all of the candidates, this is how they now rank the candidates. They put Jay Inslee at number one, Cory Booker in second, Bernie Sanders and Warren in third and fourth, respectively, Gillibrand and Gabbard with Bs, and in seventh place, that is where Joe Biden is currently. And in case you were wondering where the other candidates fall, here's a quick look at the rest of their rankings, but I'll link to the whole thing down below if you do in fact want to read more. But keep in mind that these rankings, they're not foolproof, right? They only gauge how well these candidates responded to a 29-question survey that Greenpeace sent out. It doesn't actually take into account how salient the issue of climate change 
is to a candidate. Because as we all know, Jay Inslee made this the cornerstone of his campaign. It doesn't take into consideration candidates that took the initiative before to introduce legislation to get us off of fossil fuels like Tulsi Gabbard. It doesn't consider how often candidates talk about climate change like Bernie Sanders. And also it obviously can't account for political calculations of a candidate. I mean, you can't tell if a candidate answered the question in a certain way because they were worried about how the reaction would be. I mean, Joe Biden, he flipped when he got criticism for the Hyde Amendment. So it's also possible and very likely that he flipped on climate change after getting criticism from Greenpeace. But one thing that's certain is that these voters who think that Joe Biden is the best person to take on climate change, these people are horribly horribly misinformed and this is incredibly concerning because you expect democratic party voters who are more concerned about climate change just statistically speaking to at least know that someone who's a right-wing democrat like joe biden obviously isn't going to be better on this issue than someone who is further to the left and more importantly why would you think that someone who takes corporate money fracking money, fossil fuel money, would be better than anyone else on this particular issue. Why would you think that? To think that Joe Biden is the best on climate change is so laughable, so odd, that I really worry about the future of the country if this is what Democratic voters think. Because again, they should know better, but they're horribly misinformed, not maybe as much as Republican Party voters, but still, nonetheless, they're misinformed. So, Here's what we need to do. First of all, we need to change their minds. If you know someone who supports Joe Biden, convince them. Convince them that we just tried running a centrist against Donald Trump. And if they actually want action to be taken when it comes to climate change, then we have to get Donald Trump out. But if we know a centrist lost to Donald Trump before... We don't want to try that again. And the electability argument seems to resonate with these people who support Biden. So use that weapon that they often use against us, against them. Because they tell us, oh, Bernie is an electable. And we all know that that's bullshit. But use that argument because that's what they use. So you argue against their point on their own terms. And that could be persuasive. Now, what's the second thing that we have to do? Overwhelm them at the ballot box. Get out and fucking vote. Take your friends with you. Sign them up to vote. Because if we stay home, if millennials and Gen Z doesn't vote, by default, the more conservative Democrat will win. And that makes our chances of beating Donald Trump collectively, as people on the left, worse. So this poll is... It just, it almost made my head explode. You know, I try to maintain faith and humanity in the country and voters, but it gets more difficult, right? It gets more difficult to remain optimistic when you see things like this, when they think that Joe Biden is the top choice. I mean, people, for the love of God, do your homework, because we can't fuck this up. You can't get someone in who you think is saying the right things. Joe Biden isn't even saying the right things, but we can't afford to make a mistake. You have to do your homework. You have to. And it's frustrating that that many people are that misinformed. So thankfully, Donald Trump didn't end up bombing Iran. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that he'll be taking his foot off the gas anytime soon with regard to escalating because he's still escalating. On top of the sanctions that we're already imposing on Iran, he announced new sanctions. On top of that, he warned Iran that the United States would exercise limited restraint in the face of any further Iranian quote-unquote aggression. So the situation is still terrifying and he keeps ramping up, but in an interview with Chuck Todd on Meet the Press, he talked a little bit about what it would take for him to finally de-escalate and be a leader. Ramp things down rather than continuously fan the flames. And as you're going to see towards the end of this video, this whole story with Trump and Iran, it just comes full circle, and you'll understand what I mean by that. But basically, this is his message that he wants to send to Iran. It's all about nuclear weapons. I stop escalating as long as you promise to not build a nuke. You can't have nuclear weapons, 
And other than that, we can sit down and make a deal. But you cannot have no other conditions weapons. other than that. You cannot have nuclear weapons. And they would have had them with President Obama. He gave him 150 billion dollars. What is your deal? This. I understand. But, but what but is your deal going to gonna look like with them? Let me explain something. Number one, you have to look at the sites. Some of the most important sites we weren't even allowed to look at or inspect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, the term was not long enough. Okay. There's like a short number of years left. After a very small number of years, he's talking about a country, after a very small number of years, they have a free pass to nuclear weapons. You can't do that. So to him, this is all about them getting nuclear weapons. He wants to stop that. That's what he cares about the most. Now, it's ironic coming from the guy who unilaterally withdrew from the Iran deal. Even when our European allies warned him to not do that, he did it anyway. And now he's saying, well, you know, I really want them to not get a nuke. Didn't you kind of shoot yourself in the foot in that regard, Donald Trump? And he says here that under the deal negotiated with President Obama, the JCPOA, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal, they would have been able to get a nuke. But I don't know if you noticed, but he directly contradicted himself in that same clip. He says the term was not long enough when it comes to an issue he had with the JCPOA. It's like a short number of years left. After a very small number of years, they have a free pass to nuclear weapons. So he's speaking out of both sides of his mouth simultaneously. On one hand, Obama's deal that he negotiated would have made it easier for Iran to get a nuke. However, another issue that he has with the Iran deal is that, you know, once the term is over, once it expires, then what? Then they could just get a nuclear weapon? But he didn't realize that by saying that, he was contradicting himself because he's tacitly admitting, yes, the Obama uh, nuclear deal was effective. It just wasn't long enough for my liking, but it's also not effective. So he wants to have it both ways. He claims once it expired, you know, they'd have a free pass to get nuclear weapons. But while the deal was active, they still have a free pass to get nuclear weapons. Well, which is it? Which is it? He doesn't know. Do you think that he even made it past the first page of the Iran deal? All he had to do was get to page two, and he would have known that it clearly states Iran will not pursue the development of a nuclear weapon. He doesn't read, though, so he didn't even get that far. He couldn't read past, you know, the first page of the JCPOA. Now, he keeps saying, or at least heavily suggesting here in this clip that, you know, they're not complying with the nuclear deal. And that's part of the reason why he had to pull out. You know, the terms were so weak, according to him, that Iran just wasn't in compliance. Now, to his credit, Chuck Todd actually challenges him on this and says, well, look, isn't it kind of weird that the United States is the only country that is insisting that Iran wasn't in compliance? Look at what he says here and how hypocritical his statement is. Don't you think, though, does it at all tell, what does it tell you that the Iranians haven't violated the agreement yet? That they are trying hard not to violate well, the agreement? Well, you see, I think they have violated the agreement because I think in the areas that we're not allowed to inspect, they're doing things. And I think they have been for years. Europeans don't think they're violating well, the agreement. Well, I don't care about the Europeans. The Europeans are going out and making a lot of money. The Europeans are fine, but they're going out and making a lot of money. So the reason why we can't really take the word of our European allies is because there's this conflict of interest. They profit off of the sanctions being lifted on Iran because then they get to do trade with Iran and that's beneficial to them economically. Uh, you know what he's describing here? It sounds like what he's doing when it comes to Saudi Arabia. He does the same thing. He refuses to stop selling them weapons, even if he knows they're using those weapons to bomb school buses, even if he knows that Saudi Arabia is a rogue regime that literally just killed a journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, and Donald Trump, he doesn't care about that. But if our European allies are going to benefit from the sanctions being lifted on a bad faith actor, according to him, that's bad. But when we do it, it's okay. Take their money, Todd. Take their money. That's Donald Trump. That's what he's saying. But regardless of what the United States or Europe says, the fact remains that the International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed just this last year that Iran was still compliant even after the United States pulled out. So he's a liar. Tensions are high not because Iran was not in compliance. Tensions are high because of you, Donald Trump, because you pulled out and reimposed sanctions. You violated the Iran deal. So the question is, what even is his end game here? What does he want? If he doesn't want Iran to have nuclear weapons, but at the same time, he's not willing to have the Iran deal, 
what is his end game here? Well, his end game is to have some sort of nuclear deal with Iran. We have great relationships with Europe. I don't mind Europe getting in the middle. Europe wants to make a deal too. Europe would love to see a deal be made. These going to be separate way, deals? You wanna, do you want to do a separate deal with Iran or do you want to get everybody involved in the same deal? Get uh, the Russians, I, get the Chinese. I don't, I don't care which, what kind of a deal. It can be separate or it can be total. But it's one-on-one -on -one talks you all and the it Ayatollah? Is, all is it one-on-one -on -one talks you and the Ayatollah or are you and the president? It doesn't matter to me. You know, here's what I want. Anything that gets you to the result, they cannot have a nuclear weapon. It's not about the Straits. You know, a lot of people covered okay. it incorrectly. They never mentioned. They cannot have a nuclear weapon. They'd use it. So allow me to translate that for you. Really, Todd, what I care about as president is I want to stop Iran from getting a nuke. So what I'd like to do, ideally, I'd like to negotiate some sort of deal with them where, you know, we agree to lift the sanctions if they agree that they're not going to pursue, you know, a nuclear weapon. Sort of like the Obama JCPOA that he negotiated, except with his name on it crossed off and my name put on that. That's basically what he's saying. What a moron. This is how it's come full circle. He withdrew from the Iran deal, escalates tensions because he's worried that, you know, they're going to want to pursue a nuke and he wants to get back into the same type of deal. He doesn't know what he's doing. The only reason why he withdrew from the Iran deal is because Obama did it. That's what he made clear. That is what he made crystal clear. And he also says they can't have a nuclear weapon because they'd use it. No, they wouldn't. They want a nuclear weapon if we accept that they want that as a deterrent to stop you from invading them, which you have made very clear that you want to do that. Except in this next clip, he's going to have a message to Iran and he's going to insist, look, I don't want war. But if we did have war, I'd fucking wipe you out. That's basically what he says. I'm not looking for war. And if there is, it'll be obliteration like you've never seen before. But I'm not looking to do that. But you can't have a nuclear weapon. You want to talk good, otherwise you can have a bad economy no for the next three years. N not as far as I'm concerned, no preconditions. And you'll talk anyway? Here it is, look. You can't have nuclear weapons. And if you want to talk about it, good. Otherwise, you can live in a shattered economy for a long time to come. Listen, Iran. I want peace with you. There's nothing I want more than peace. However, if we do have to go to war, I'm going to wipe you off the face of the fucking planet. But I don't want that, though. Do you see how everything has come full circle now? I mean, he pulled out of the Iran deal and he's escalating with them as a means of putting pressure on them to get them to come to the table to sign on to a nuclear deal. I mean, it's like this is a comedy movie that we're witnessing play out in reality. Where we have fucking Mr. Bean as the president. And he's just walking into doors, walking into glass, falling down. This is like a slapstick comedy. I don't know what else to say. It's all come full circle. He pulls out of the Iran deal, but now he wants an Iran deal. Maybe you shouldn't have pulled out from the get-go, dipshit. Maybe you should have, like, asked them if they can cross out Obama's name so you can write your name in, if that's truly what you wanted, so you can take credit for it. <sighs> Dumb. Dumb motherfucker. Columnist E. Jean Carroll had an excerpt from her book published in New York Magazine on June 21st, and in this piece... She details how Donald Trump raped her. Now, her story is similar to the stories of the 15 other women who accused Donald Trump of sexual misconduct. You know, he was very forceful. He kissed them, you know, without getting their consent. But what she's going to describe here goes further than anyone else's story. She's going to describe how he raped her. When we walked into the lingerie department, there was nobody there, which was strange. It was in the evening, so. And on the counter were three really fancy boxes and a see-through bodysuit. He walked right to the bodysuit and snatched it up and said, go put this on. 
Now, that struck me as so funny because here I am, 52. I am not going to be put. My idea was, I said, no, you put it on. And he said, no, it looks like it fits you. I said, no, it goes with your eyes. So I am spinning a comedy scene and in my head. Of course, banter, back and forth. I get it. But Total you banter. see how funny that would be to make him put yes. that on. Right. Yes, and you, by the way, used to be a comedy writer on Saturday Night Live. Right. You were engaging in this banter, as I think many of us would, because yes. you didn't know what violence was no, about I had... to unfold, and you could never have known that. How and would I know that? Of course. And Although so... I thought I was pretty stupid. Well, I mean, I understand that afterwards, in retrospect, you blame yourself. Many women in this situation do. However, you go into the dressing room, you think that he's going to hold it up against him, yeah. and then it gets violent. Well, he, the minute he, he went like this, I preceded him into the dressing room. The minute he closed that door, I was banged up against the wall. He slammed you against the wall. Yeah, I hit my head really hard. Boom. And you point out and that he's a tall, big person, and six, he pinned three. you in some way. Well, I'm a tall person, too. I was 6'1 in my heels, and I was a competitive athlete. So, you know, when somebody shows you... The thing is, it shocked me. It, for a moment, I was stunned, right? And then he tried to kiss me, which was... It was so hard. But So my reaction was to laugh, to knock off the erotic whatever he had going on, because the man, when you laugh at him, he's like, Ugh, no. You know, he just went at it. And when you say went at it, you know, I mean... He pulled down my tights. And uh, it was a fight. It was a... I want women to know that I did not stand there. I did not freeze. I was not paralyzed, which is a reaction that I could have had because it's so shocking. No, I fought. Uh, and um, it was over very quickly. It was against my will, 100%. And I ran away, out. And he pinned you, I mean, just uh, without getting overly graphic, he pinned you against the wall. He, yeah, he held his sh shoulder he put, against you. He put his yeah. shoulder against you. And he is, you're right, He's. Been, you made that point. He's much bigger than you are. I mean, I, not just tall, I mean, in terms of... Yeah, he would, the, yeah. The, yeah. His massiveness. Um, and so he pinned you against the wall, he ripped off your tights, and... Not all the way off, just down. Down. He pulled down his pants. He, no, just unzipped. He unzipped his pants. And this is beyond sexual. I mean, legally, he raped you. I don't use the word. I have difficulty with the word. I, I you think see it, it as a fight. I yes. just, I don't, you know. I understand, but you, you see it as a fight and you don't want to be seen as a victim, and I totally get that. Don't want to be seen as a victim because I over, quickly over, went past it. It was a very, very brief episode of my life. Very brief. I am not faced with sexual violence every single day like many women around the world. And so, yes, I'm very careful with that word. I understand. I, I like you, you will use it. You're an... Well, here's the situation. I understand that you don't want this to define you, of course, mm. who would? But I'm saying legally, it was rape. It's unambiguous. What you describe in the mm. book, mm. it was rape. And that actually goes further than the 15 women who came forward um, during the campaign who to say that they, they describe situations very similar to what you experienced. Him getting them into a room, him pinning them against a wall, him forcing a kiss on them. Mm -hmm. But yours actually goes further in terms of being legally rape. That's what it was. Now, so we're clear here, Alison Camarota is correct. Legally speaking, the details absolutely constitute rape. And since that was on cable news, they couldn't get into all of the gruesome details. But in this piece, it's laid out pretty clearly, and it is downright disturbing. I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs here. The next moment, still wearing correct business attire, shirt, tie, suit, jacket, overcoat, he opens the overcoat, unzips his pants, and forcing his fingers around my private area, thrusts his penis halfway or completely, I'm not certain, inside me. It turns into a colossal struggle. The whole episode lasts no more than three minutes. I do not believe he ejaculates. So this is incredibly serious. These allegations are explosive. This is a scandal. And she addresses why she didn't come out sooner. 
And it's the same reason why someone wouldn't want to come out and accuse a very powerful person of this type of behavior. It's because she was worried she would receive death threats. She was worried that she would be attacked. And that's basically what Donald Trump did. Now, his initial response was to deny that he even knew her. He claims he never even met Carol, but the article literally contained a photograph of them together. So that's obviously on its face completely absurd, but here's what he also said in response to these allegations. Quote, I'll say it with great respect. Number one, she's not my type. Number two, it never happened. It never happened, okay? It never happened, just like it never happened with the 15 other women. Who are you gonna believe? Are you gonna believe them, the accusers, or the guy who admitted on tape that he sexually assaults women. I grab him by the pussy. I don't even wait. He talked about how they let them do this because he's a celebrity. So, I mean, first of all, let's just address how disgusting that response is. He insults her. She's not my type. Second of all, is this a credible allegation? Yes, regardless if you believe it or not. This is a serious story, and it should be taken seriously. But the problem is that it's not really being taken seriously. In fact, the media collectively yawned when this story was first announced, and many are pointing out that Joe Biden's creepy behavior actually received more coverage than this. And even though I do think that the Joe Biden story is an important story, this is obviously much more serious, much more explosive. So the problem is, this story demonstrates how we have become desensitized to these types of stories. And Trump's repulsiveness isn't really even shocking or surprising to people anymore, to the point where he could be credibly accused of rape and nobody even bats an eyelash. That's the state of American politics. Now, do I think that this story has any chance of hurting Donald Trump whatsoever? No, I don't. So the question is, if I don't think that this is going to hurt Donald Trump or affect him in any way, shape, or form. If we all know that this doesn't necessarily demonstrate the types of policies that he would implement, then why am I talking about this? What's the point? If everybody's desensitized, um, Republicans probably won't believe her, and everybody else doesn't really seem to care that much, why even talk about it? It's because we have to. We can't normalize this type of behavior. We can't normalize these types of allegations. If something like this comes out, we need to react very strongly to this because this is a serious, serious allegation. And no, it may not tell us about Trump's politics, but it tells us about the type of person he is. He's an amoral monster who disregards the harm he causes to other people. And that's not the type of person who should be anywhere near the Oval Office. So even if this isn't policy related and you can say, well, you know, this, we should be focusing on the real issues, the policy issues, because this doesn't affect me. It still is important because we need to know the type of person that the president is. He's a monster who was accused of raping a woman. She's the 16th accuser, the 16th, who accused someone who admitted he sexually assaults women of sexually assaulting her. So I can't not talk about this. I can't sweep this under the rug. I can't allow widespread desensitization to contribute to the normalization of this type of behavior. We have to fight this and we have to make it known that we care. These allegations are serious and we need to communicate to people that we care and we want to hear these stories. We want you to speak out if you have been sexually assaulted or raped because that's the type of culture that we should be fostering as an egalitarian society. And it really is, it's honestly heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that this was basically, you know, a non-story. And I get that there's a lot of other things, right? Trump almost bombed Iran. Uh, there's so much going on. People are struggling. But at the same time, this is still important and it does deserve attention. And the fact that it didn't get that attention, the fact that outlets like the New York Times had to come out and say, you know, we didn't really do a good job here in promoting this story. We put this in the book section, um, or maybe it was New York Magazine. One of them put this in the book section since this was an excerpt from her book. We can't let this happen. We can't normalize this type of behavior when it, when it happens. When somebody credibly accuses someone in power of rape, we have to react in a way that we, we would react to anyone else.
who isn't Donald Trump, where this isn't, you know, unsurprising. Treat each and every single one of these allegations serious because they're very serious. The day we have all been waiting for has finally arrived tonight is night number one of the two-night Democratic Party presidential debates. And this is a really big deal because this is the first debate. This will set the stage for the rest of the primaries. This will make or break candidates. And I'm absolutely excited. I'm ecstatic about this. Um, I actually was having trouble sleeping last night because I was thinking about the debates. So this is a big deal. This is, you know, the playoffs. This is the Super Bowl. Or maybe the election itself is more like the Super Bowl. Maybe I shouldn't have invoked a sports analogy when I know nothing about sports. So disregard everything I just said. Doesn't matter. Let's talk about what we can expect tonight. So here's what I think is going to happen. There's probably going to be one breakout star. I don't know who that's going to be, but this will be based not necessarily on policy substance, but it will be based on performance, who can basically get their message across and do it in a really forceful and persuasive way. Now, here's what I really want to see happen. This is on my wish list. First of all, I want everyone to punch left. I'm rooting for Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard. I want both of them to punch left. I want Elizabeth Warren to hit these corporate Democrats on stage, like Cory Booker, like John Delaney. And when it comes to Tulsi Gabbard, she really needs to get her name across. How could she do that? What in my view, would make me feel satisfied if she just came out and pulled no punches and she hit Elizabeth Warren because of her wishy-washiness on Medicare for All. So if Tulsi Gabbard said, look, I'm the only candidate on this stage who has been consistent when it comes to the issue of Medicare for All, Elizabeth Warren claims to be a progressive, but she's been wishy-washy on this, and now she's talking about many paths to Medicare for All. Which is it? Do you want someone who doesn't even have a health care plan that they're absolutely behind unequivocally, or do you want someone who's been consistent? If she did that, that would be huge, and it would force Elizabeth Warren to be introspective and actually take a stand and stop sitting on the fence. I also want to see Tulsi hit everyone on foreign policy. You've got some warmongers on that stage. Now, they're not warmongers in the neocon sense, but they have pushed for escalation between the United States and Russia. They've pushed for intervention, maybe not militarily, but intervention nonetheless when it comes to Venezuela. I want her to hit them on that. I want Elizabeth Warren to call out these people who aren't taking bold policy approaches. I want her to call out John Delaney and ask him why he's not in favor of regulating Wall Street to the extent that she is. If I get these really big moments, that to me, I think, would be great for the candidate. Elizabeth Warren, she doesn't necessarily have to win this debate, but what she does need to do in order to come out on top is just maintain, right? Because she's the front runner out of this field when you look at public polling. So she just needs to maintain momentum. She doesn't need to do amazing or perform exceptionally well. She just can't face plan because that could hurt her. For a candidate like Tulsi Gabbard, this has to be her moment. She's got to have a breakout moment. And I hope that she's aggressive. And I know that that necessarily isn't her demeanor because she's more calm, but she's got to be forceful. And there's 10 candidates on the stage. She's got to force her way, you know, into conversation. She's got to make make sure that people know who she is. When it comes to Cory Booker, I'd say this also needs to be a breakout night for him. Same with Julian Castro. They have enough policies to where they could frame themselves as progressives. I don't necessarily think that would be persuasive. However, the general public may buy it. When it comes to Beto O'Rourke, this really is make or break. If he doesn't have a breakout moment tonight, I think he's done. Because he's already admitted that his campaign is struggling, he had to do a relaunch and had a slight bump in the polls, and then he's back down. This has got to be a breakout for uh, Beto O'Rourke. Um, otherwise, I just don't think he's going to have enough momentum to even make it past Iowa very far. You know, so... This really is a huge moment. People who I think will probably be overlooked and not have much of a presence. Uh, Tim Ryan, I don't even know what he stands for. So he's got to make his presence known in a really substantial way and have one signature issue. Like we already expect Tulsi Gabbard to come out swinging when it comes to foreign policy. And additionally, we expect Elizabeth Warren to come out with really good domestic policy proposals. I don't know what to expect from Tim Ryan, so he's got to really...
put up. Otherwise, I don't see how he can, you know, have the momentum to continue. Jay Inslee, here's the thing with Jay Inslee, and this is his problem. He made climate change his signature policy proposal. The thing is that it's going to be very difficult for him to break out because his passion when it comes to climate change, even if that's admirable, I think that Elizabeth Warren, Tulsi Gabbard, even Bill de Blasio, they can very persuasively make the case that they're as equally passionate about it. And they all have more name recognition. So I just, I'm going to find it difficult to imagine a scenario where Jay Inslee has a breakout moment, but maybe he can set himself apart because that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. You know, with foreign policy, Tulsi Gabbard has a very persuasive case to be made as to why she's the best. When it comes to regulating Wall Street, Elizabeth Warren has the same case. When it comes to climate change, you know, Jay Inslee is not a national figure, and there are other candidates who are also great on this, so it's going to be tough for him. I don't know if he can uh, pull it off, but we'll see when it comes to Amy Klobuchar. I mean, I'm not sure what to expect from Amy Klobuchar. And the best that we can hope for when it comes to Amy Klobuchar is that she overshadows John Delaney, who is, um, he's basically in the same camp as her, but I think he's worse because he's actually going out of his way to attack policies like Medicare for All, which are extremely popular, and that hurts the cause for Medicare for All. So even if she doesn't agree, she's at least politically astute enough to know to be quiet about her criticisms with regard to Medicare for All. So I think that what we're going to see is probably John Delaney get canceled out by Amy Klobuchar, although he could just be a better debate performer. So it's difficult to predict. Bill de Blasio, I think he's going to try to position himself as the progressive. He's going to try to outshine Elizabeth Warren. I don't think people are going to buy it. So I'm not going to keep, you know, talking about this too long because the debate is in a couple of hours. Let's all tune in. Uh, I certainly will. And you could expect my post-debate analysis about an hour or two after the debate. I will be posting that tonight. It may get out, you know, at midnight, but nonetheless, it will be out. Um, here's how I'm going to be analyzing the debate. I'm going to pick who I think won based on performance overall. Then I'm going to tell you who I liked based on policy. Spoiler alert, it's going to be Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard. That's probably going to hinge on who got the most time to talk. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, who had a breakout moment that could help them. And we'll talk about the losers because, you know, I love talking about the losers because there's quite a bit of losers on this stage so um, i'm looking forward to it and i will be live tweeting the debate I'm not going to film it uh, or stream it because i think it would be difficult for me to mute my criticism and reactions because i just have a big mouth and i won't be able to shut up and i think that would ruin the experience for other people so i will post a follow-up video once it's done and we'll all go from there i'm excited though well, night one of the first 2020 Democratic Party primary debate has officially concluded, and that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I really found it entertaining. It was uh, thoroughly enjoyable for me because I'm a nerd. Donald Trump certainly didn't like it because he tweeted that it was boring, but you know, nobody cares about what he has to say. He thinks that Fox News is entertaining. But I'm going to give you my breakdown of this debate. In this video, we're going to get to the winners, the losers, the good moments, the bad moments, but I will probably do a follow-up with a couple of clips because there were some moments that I want to explore a little bit um, in, in greater detail. So just generally speaking, let me just say that even though Bernie Sanders did not attend this debate, he still had a presence here because a lot of the issues that were talked about were popularized by Bernie Sanders. Medicare for all policies that actually help provide jobs for the working class that are aimed at tackling climate change simultaneously. I mean, all of these broad themes, they're being discussed because of Bernie Sanders. So he may not have been here, but he still had a pretty substantial influence. Now, getting to statistics about this particular debate, when you look at the overall time that each candidate got to speak, according to this poll by the Washington Post, Cory Booker got to speak the most, and they usually seem to call on candidates who were polling higher. So Elizabeth Warren, at least for the first half, was called on pretty frequently. Beto O'Rourke was called on. And just broadly speaking, the candidates with the higher polling 
tended to, you know, overall get to speak the most. Although there were some people like John Delaney who kind of just elbowed his way in and got as much talk time as Tulsi Gabbard, which irritated me because he just wouldn't shut up. He kept butting in. And I get that that's what you're supposed to do. But if you're going to butt in and not say something substantive and meaningful, then I you need to be quiet. Stay in your lane. Wait to jump in until you have an issue that really speaks to you. But everything he said was horrible. So I'm kind of spoiling who I think was one of the losers. But one more uh, graph that I want to show you is this graph about the number of times that Donald Trump was invoked. Looks like Amy Klobuchar invoked Donald Trump quite a bit. Tulsi Gabbard invoked him three times. And I do think that this is important to invoke the Republican opponent who you may or may not be running against because it shows that you're confident it shows that you're not afraid to take on Donald Trump. You are not afraid to stand up to someone who may be your opponent. So I think that by criticizing Donald Trump, it demonstrates strength. Although for candidates like Elizabeth Warren, she didn't mention Donald Trump. But at the same time, I can't fault her for that because I think that what she did was fantastic in terms of staying close to policy, talking about corruption. So let me get to the winners and the losers. This debate did not turn out in the way that I expected. Um, I think that we kind of had an upset. So I'll tell you who I think won. But first, let me just broadly speaking, give you a couple of categories. So I have four categories that I've created here. So we've got um, good, well, that means the candidate did okay. Uh, we have the Mac category, and then we have the losers. Now, who do I think are the losers? John Delaney and Beto O'Rourke. Now, I think that overall, John Delaney is probably the biggest loser because he didn't have a breakout moment. He spoke for a relatively long you know, period of time in comparison with other candidates, and he didn't have a moment where he shined. He criticized Medicare for all. When it comes to Beto O'Rourke, he couldn't answer questions. I mean... I think it was Aaron Matei who said on Twitter that he just made history by not answering a question in two different languages. I mean, he has nothing but platitudes, and Booker has the same problem, so I wouldn't necessarily say that Beto lost because of this, but he always opens an answer to a question about a personal story or an anecdote. You know, I talked to Timmy in Iowa, and he said this, and um, Gene in uh, New Hampshire said this, Beto just answered the question. Cut to the chase, answer the question. So that's one of the reasons why I think he didn't perform well. But another reason why he didn't perform well is because this was kind of a dog pile on Beto O'Rourke. There were numerous moments where you had uh, um, Julian Castro go after Beto. You had Bill de Blasio go after Beto on numerous occasions. So people were shitting on Beto. And I loved it. He was backed into a corner. He also didn't answer questions. It just wasn't a good look. And I said prior to this debate, that this was make or break for Beto, because he's going down on the polls. I believe one poll had him tied with Mike Gravel. He had to shine here, and he didn't. Didn't expect much from John Delaney, and he basically performed as well as I expected him to. Getting into the meh category, Amy Klobuchar. She, I mean, she didn't have a breakout moment. She said things that were um, pretty boring and milk toast, but she didn't fumble. She didn't face plant um, too badly at any point. It was just very meh. Tim Ryan, he actually seemed to have this mid-debate strategy shift, and he wasn't really saying much. But towards the middle half of the debate... He started to kind of stand out and talk about, you know, we need to stand up for the middle class and we need to play offense and go after Republicans. And I thought that that was really strong. Had he not taken those stands, um, he probably would have been in the loser category. But because he kind of came with something, anything, um, you know, that got him moved up into the meh category for me. Here's who I think did well. They didn't lose... But there was more to be desired. Maybe they had a couple of good moments. So in this category, Cory Booker, Tulsi Gabbard, and Jay Inslee. Cory Booker, he had some good moments, but um, nothing that really stood out too much. He has the same problem that Beto has, as I mentioned. 
He just, he doesn't know how to not come off as a rehearsed politician. He doesn't know how to make it seem like, you know, every sentence he says is contrived. He can't help himself. He's just a rehearsed, thumb-pointing politician. But I mean, with that being said, I think he was incredibly knowledgeable when it comes to LGBTQ rights. He talks intelligently about a lot of issues, but um, I just, I don't think he was the winner. He didn't do bad. He did, he did well. He did okay. Not going to hurt him. Not necessarily going to give him a boost because I don't think he was the standout. When it comes to Tulsi Gabbard, throughout the first three quarters of the debate, I was screaming at my screen, begging her to jump in because I was looking at some of these uh, graphs from the Washington Post. She wasn't getting much talk time. She wasn't getting called on. And when it became clear that they weren't really going to call on her that much... At that point, she needed to take the gloves off, elbow her way into that conversation, start interrupting, start chiming in like John Delaney was doing. Um, but the reason why I think overall she did well is because she had the one moment she really needed to have. She had a breakout moment, and it was probably one of the highlights, if not the highlight of the night, when she just basically owned Tim Ryan when it comes to his um, support for the U.S. empire. He talked about staying in Afghanistan indefinitely. She chimed in, made him look like a dunce. That was such a powerful moment that that single-handedly moved her up. But going into the next debate, she has to be more aggressive. I get that her demeanor is more calm, and this isn't a criticism of Tulsi Gabbard. I'm speaking more to debate performance and strategy. She has to be more assertive and more aggressive because I think that a lot of these candidates, when you have like 10 people on the stage, you're going to have at least two people that will try to chime in and take up all the air in the room. Th this debate, you know, John Delaney was kind of that guy who kept inserting himself into the conversation when nobody really wanted to hear from him. So you have people like that that you're competing with. You also have the front runners who are pull pulling higher who you're competing with. So going into this next debate, I really, really hope that she pulls the gloves off and she just hammers more people because when she hammered Tim Ryan, that was a bright moment. And if you give her two or three more um, moments like that, this could really help her. Had she not had that moment, I would have been worried. I would have moved her into the mad category only because she didn't get a chance to speak. But because that moment was so amazing and I just, I was living for it. She, she stole my heart right there. Um, because of that, she's in the well category. Um, hopefully that alone will bring people's attention to, you know, her foreign policy platform because she's great on foreign policy. She's the best in this race on foreign policy. It's just a matter of, making sure you make your case and you make it well. Um, when it comes to Jay Inslee, I think he performed okay. You know, he didn't really have any bright moments. When it comes to who's a geopolitical threat, and we'll talk about the framing of that question later on, but he said Donald Trump. You're the climate change guy. You've got to say climate change. So I still think that he did a, you know, an acceptable job, a passable job, at focusing on his issue, but in comparison with Tulsi Gabbard, like she has foreign policy, he has climate change. I don't think he did as well, but overall his performance throughout the debate was a little bit more consistent. Like with Tulsi Gabbard, we were trailing, you know, just pretty, pretty low. And then we had this big boost for him. He was kind of in the middle the entire time. So that's why I put these candidates in the, uh, they did well category. Okay. So, when it comes to the good category, I placed Elizabeth Warren in this category, Julian Castro in this category, and Bill de Blasio in this category. Now, keep in mind, this is not me endorsing their policies. This is me speaking to their debate performance. Who did I think won this debate? I'm shocked to hear myself say this, but it was Bill de Blasio. Bill de Blasio won this debate. And one thing I said in my pre-debate analysis was that he would try to be the progressive. He tried to outflank the rest of the people on stage and try to out Bernie Elizabeth Warren, so to speak. And what he said was great. Now, do I believe anything that Bill de Blasio has to say? Um, no, not necessarily. I think he's full of shit. Back in 2016, he could have endorsed a true progressive like Bernie Sanders, but he endorsed Hillary Clinton during the primary when, like, it wasn't over at all. So he isn't the real deal. With that being said, on debate performance, he hit it out of the park. Now, originally, 
I thought it was very clear that Elizabeth Warren was dominating, but she was only dominating when she was being called on. Once they stopped calling on her, she kind of just faded away. And throughout the second half of the debate, she was a non-entity. However, in that first half, she was absolutely amazing. Her performance was just top tier. And she did what she needed to do. I think she did enough to maintain her lead, possibly grow it, especially because of her answer on Medicare for All. Now, Julian Castro, he was kind of the breakout here. I don't think he's the winner of this debate, but he was a breakout star. And this is because he came off as someone who was very strong, not necessarily on economic issues, but he spoke very intelligently about issues related to um, race and gender. Um, he absolutely dominated the debate on immigration. So he did a good job when it comes to his performance. But overall, I think the standout here, surprisingly, was Bill de Blasio. Bill de Blasio. How weird is that? So let's get to some specific moments here. Um, I already touched on this, but we have to talk about that moment between Tulsi Gabbard and Tim Ryan. That moment was so thoroughly embarrassing for Tim Ryan. Not only did she challenge him on his interventionist views, but she got him to stumble because he said that the Taliban attacked us on 9-11 and she corrected him. She looked incredibly strong right there. Tim Ryan looked incredibly weak. Had it not been for that performance, he would have been pretty good, you know, overall. But she hammered him hard. And I think that what she gave us there was a glimpse at how powerful she could be if she wielded her knowledge in a more effective way. We know now that she's got it in her to be an attack dog. Now she just needs to do this and hit the other candidates. That was phenomenal. But we'll get to that in a separate segment. Um, another highlight for me was when Julian Castro called out Beto O'Rourke because he claims to be great on immigration. You know, he started the first question speaking in Spanish, which led to Cory Booker giving him, you know, pretty hilarious side-eye and Elizabeth Warren too. He tries to appear to be a strong person on immigration, but Julian Castro called him out because he doesn't want to repeal 1325, which it decriminalizes someone entering uh, the country illegally. It drops it from, you know, a federal crime to a civil offense. If you don't support that, then you're just not as compassionate as you say you are, Beto. Now, the moment for me that was probably one of the highlights was that Elizabeth Warren finally, finally gave us what we wanted when it comes to Medicare for All. So the question was posed to the candidates, which of you support getting rid of private health insurance companies? Only two candidates, sadly, raised their hands, Bill de Blasio and Elizabeth Warren. I was very disappointed that Tulsi Gabbard didn't also raise her hand because she's been an advocate for Medicare for All. And I wish she would have raised her hand. Now, there's a question about whether or not, well, you know, does Medicare for All actually get rid of private insurance companies? Um, Pretty much. That's the answer. It's complicated. This is nuanced. But if you support Medicare for All, in short, you should have raised your hand. So let me explain to you the complicated provision in both Bernie Sanders' bill and Pramila Jayapal's bill. Does it outright ban uh, supplemental private insurance? No. In fact, it states explicitly that it doesn't intend to outlaw that. However, there's a big caveat. It does rule out, it prohibits duplicative care. So if the federal government is providing you with, you know, these types of healthcare coverages. We know that Bernie's Medicare for All plan, for example, covers um, uh, eye exams. That cannot be sold on the private market. It bans duplicative care. So because Bernie and Jayapal's bills ban duplicative care, what's the implication? The overall goal is to phase out these private insurance companies. That's exactly what these bills are intended and designed specifically to do. Now, there's a question of, well, what about for cosmetic surgeries? Like if you want to get, you know, a nose job, for example, can you still get insurance covered for that? The answer technically is yes. But if you talk to anyone who gets these cosmetic procedures, if you get braces, for example, I had braces, you don't get insurance for that. 
you finance that most of the time. Like an insurance company isn't going to cover you for a really expensive procedure knowing that they won't be able to, be able to profit off of you, right? So for these types of cosmetic procedures, you're not really going to be able to get insurance anyway. So overall, the goal is to phase out private insurance companies. And if you support Medicare for All, you want private insurance companies to be phased out. And the reason for that is because if you don't phase them out, then those capitalistic forces will attack our public Medicare for All plan. And they're going to try to get portions of it privatized so they can get a larger share of the market. So if you support Medicare for All, you have to get on board with abolishing private insurance companies. Elizabeth Warren and uh, Bill de Blasio surprised me here by doing that. Tulsi Gabbard surprised me for by not doing that. But hopefully she will get on board because if you're, you're going to support Medicare for all, you have to be strong. You have to be strong. And you've got to get on board with abolishing private insurance companies. You have to. Now, Elizabeth Warren said what I needed her to say. I'm with Bernie and she explicitly said she supports Medicare for all. This is what we've been waiting on Elizabeth Warren to do. Although there's a little bit of irony here because, you know, it was phrased in the way of, well, so are you with Bernie or do you support many paths? She walked away from that and she said, I'm with Bernie. She said that unequivocally. However, if a candidate has to say I'm with another candidate, the implication is, well, maybe I should just vote for that candidate that they're with i.e. Bernie Sanders. So, um, you know, she she did the right thing, but she needs to be consistent. She's been incredibly wishy-washy. She's gone back and forth, back and forth. Once and for all, she needs to say, I'm for or against Medicare for All, and she needs to be clear. We got an indication that she's putting her feet in the Medicare for All camp, although uh, I'm not going to lie, I can't really trust her because she keeps going back and forth. But based on debate performance, um, she did the right thing here. So let me just give you the rundown on some quick things here. When it comes to Warren's answer on the economy, I think she had a great response to the economy. Who's it working for? When it comes to free college, Amy Klobuchar had the generic corporate Democrat talking point that, you know, I don't want to pay for free college for rich kids. I don't think Americans should bear that burden. Except rich kids aren't going to go to public universities, Klobuchar. That's what Hillary Clinton said in 2016, and people made fun of her for it because you're not acknowledging, or at least you're, you know, you're ignoring the fact that rich people are going to go to private educations regardless if we make public universities tuition free. So you're not going to be paying for the education of rich people. That's a cop out and a bad answer. Beto O'Rourke refused to answer the question as to whether or not he supports a 70% marginal tax, to which Bill de Blasio then hit him on that, which I loved. Elizabeth Warren channeled Bernie Sanders, channeled AOC, and talked about investing in green energy, circling back to healthcare. I'm glad that Bill de Blasio hit Beto for his weakness here. I'm glad that Elizabeth Warren was incredibly strong. Tulsi Gabbard, even though she disappointed me by not raising her hand when it comes to the question of abolishing private insurance, she still stood out by talking about the cost savings of Medicare for All on private businesses, how other countries have implemented Medicare for All. This is a great point that needed to be brought up. So between Gabbard, Warren, and de Blasio, they were the strongest on healthcare, but definitely Warren and de Blasio because they committed to abolishing private insurance. The weakest were Booker and definitely Inslee because they both brought up access. And whenever a politician drops access in the context of healthcare, that's code for, I don't support Medicare for all. Now, when it comes to immigration, Julian Castro dominated. Uh, something he said that really resonated with me. He said, we need a Marshall Plan for Honduras and Guatemala to fix this issue. Great response, because nobody ever focuses when talking about immigration on the way that our policies have ruined these countries. The drug war, you know, these trade policies. They haven't worked out, especially when it comes to NAFTA in Mexico. Not not so much, you know, Honduras and Guatemala, but these countries have been ravaged due to our war on drugs. By bringing up a Marshall Plan, that's a great idea that I hope Bernie steals. Great, great idea from him. Um, one thing that Booker said that was really poignant, he said they don't leave their human rights 
at the border when they come here. That was a great line. When it comes to Iran, predictably, Tulsi Gabbard, she absolutely shined here. Um, she called Donald Trump a chicken hawk. She demonstrated why we need to stop escalating, why we need to de-escalate when it comes to the issue of guns. Warren's answer, it didn't impress me. I expected more. Tim Ryan, he did kind of take a more Republican-oriented approach by talking about the need for mental health. And I think this is important because you're kind of arguing on Republicans' terms. You're saying, look, if you say mental health is the issue, I'm willing to address that. Let's talk about it. So then let's help solve this crisis by adding that. So I think that was good that he brought that up because you're kind of reaching across the aisle in a way where you're not sacrificing your principles. When it comes to the question of what do we do about Mitch McConnell, none of them satisfied me here. None of them were strong enough. None of them. You need to come out so strong against Mitch McConnell because any sign of weakness will be exploited by Mitch McConnell. It will be exploited by Republicans. So if you're not going to come out strong against Mitch McConnell, and how to fight him if you don't have a detailed plan as to how you're going to fight him. I'm just not going to be impressed by that because he's a very effective leader. We may not like him. We may vociferously disagree with everything he stands for. But you can't deny that he is one of the most effective leaders in recent history when it comes to the issue of climate change. Jay Inslee was predictably strong here. But I don't like the right-wing framing. Like Chuck Todd asked the question about climate change to Beto O'Rourke, and he framed it in the way of, you know, what do you say to people who are worried about big government? Chuck, that's not the question that we should be asking. When we're talking climate change, we're talking about an existential threat to humanity. I don't care about the size of government. Whatever tackles climate change, big government, small government, it's big government, spoiler alert, but whatever is going to get the job done is what we should be in favor for. So that's just... The framing is so off, and Chuck Todd did this on numerous occasions. Another question that was framed odd was on this issue of gun confiscation. Like, he implied that a gun buyback program was confiscation. But thankfully, Amy Klobuchar actually called him out for this, or she didn't call him out, but she corrected the record, and she said, no, you know, a gun buyback pr program is not tantamount to confiscation. That's, that's not correct. Now, another thing I wanted to talk about was LGBTQ rights. Tulsi Gabbard was asked about LGBTQ rights, and I thought that she gave a thoughtful answer. Cory Booker then jumped in, and he kind of one-upped her, because he really demonstrated knowledge, concrete knowledge of these issues that are affecting the LGBTQ community. He talked about LGBTQ youth in schools. He talked about violence against uh, trans women of color. Really important. And Tulsi Gabbard was going to respond, and I was looking forward to her response. They cut her off. They cut her off. So Tim Ryan got the opportunity to respond to Tulsi Gabbard when she challenged him later in the debate. But here, when Cory Booker didn't necessarily challenge Tulsi, but he tried to one-up her and outshine her, she didn't get the chance to respond. That frustrated me. As an LGBTQ American, I wanted to hear what she had to say. I wanted to hear what she had to say. So that frustrated me. That was a moment that um, it showed how shitty the moderation got once Lester Holt and Samantha Guthrie left because Chuck Todd is just an embarrassment. Rachel Maddow was bad as well, but not as bad as Chuck Todd. When it comes to the issue of impeachment, John Delaney said something that really stood out to me because of how incredibly stupid it was. He said that he believes, let me get my notes. He says, I support Pelosi. She knows more about this subject when it comes to impeachment than all of the 2020 candidates combined. John. How weak are you? And simultaneously, as he said that, his team put out a tweet that said, nobody should be above the law, including the president of the United States. Except if you don't support impeachment when the president has committed crimes, then you literally do believe, functionally speaking, that the president is above the law because he just committed crimes. So if you don't think he should be impeached, then you think he's above the law. That's what your position effectively ends up being. So John Delaney, I mean, this is one of many reasons as to why I think he just completely embarrassed himself here. So overall, I thought that this was an incredibly entertaining debate. But here's what I think going forward will happen. If John Delaney and um, Beto O'Rourke don't really start to have some forward movement, I just don't know 
how their campaigns can be sustained, especially John Delaney. If you look at his Twitter feed, at least, if we're gauging anything based on that or gauging how well he's doing based on that, he has like zero support. There's no momentum. If you look at the images he's posting from meetings that he's having with people in Iowa, four, five people attended. So I don't even know how he has the funding to keep going. And this debate didn't help him at all. Same with Beto O'Rourke. I just, he didn't do good here. He needed to pull out a victory in some way, maybe not win, but certainly stand out. And he didn't. And, you know, Julian Castro, Bill de Blasio, they certainly didn't help. One thing I will say about Elizabeth Warren, even if all of her answers were very thoughtful and everything she said basically was excellent, I'll give her the same advice that I'm giving to Tulsi Gabbard. I think you should go out of your way to kind of insert yourself into the conversations more frequently. Now, certainly Tulsi Gabbard should do this more than Elizabeth Warren because Elizabeth Warren... She just has to not fail since she's currently leading out of all of those candidates. With Tulsi, this is more important because we need her to get a boost in the polls. So that's what you want to do if you want to get your name out there more and get the message across. I would have liked to see that more from Warren, at least in the second half, when she started to kind of fade into the background. So long as she keeps a constant presence, I think, you know, she's great. But with that being said, when it's all said and done, um, this was entertaining. And I think... The, uh, you know, the policies that were talked about were mostly substantive. I don't like the framing by Chuck Todd. I don't like some of the questions asked, you know, who's the biggest geopolitical threat to the United States that implies that anyone is a threat to us when we are the biggest military in the history of humankind. So those issues aside, I think it went well. It was entertaining. And this really is exciting to watch. I look forward to seeing tomorrow's debate. One of my favorite moments of the first debate was this exchange between Tulsi Gabbard and Tim Ryan. Because when it comes to the issue of foreign policy, whenever that topic came up, we needed to hear from Tulsi Gabbard desperately because she is pushing the Overton window to the left within the Democratic Party, who has grown increasingly hawkish. And there's a lot of people who just aren't well-versed on U.S. imperialism. They don't know about U.S. interventionism. They fall for this trap, like Beto O'Rourke, of us needing to intervene for quote-unquote humanitarian reasons, which the United States always makes matters worse. So we needed to desperately hear from Tulsi Gabbard. And more importantly, we needed a moment that would allow her to demonstrate her knowledge on this subject particularly, um, or preferably rather, one where she calls out someone who's a hawk. And boy, did she deliver, because in this clip I'm about to play for you, she thoroughly dismantled the argument of Tim Ryan, who was pushing for intervention, and holy shit, she ripped him a new asshole. <laughs> Take a look. I've been in Congress 17 years. And 12 of those years, I've sat on the Armed Services Committee, either the Defense Appropriations Committee or the Armed Services Committee. And the lesson that I've learned over the years is that you have to stay engaged in these situations. Nobody likes it. It's long. It's tedious. But right now we have, so I would say we must be engaged in this. We must have our State Department engaged. We must have our military engaged to the, st to the extent they need to be. But the reality of it is this president doesn't even have people appointed in the State Department to deal with these things. Whether we're talking about Central America, whether we're talking about Iran, whether we're talking about Afghanistan, we've got to be completely engaged. And here's why. Because these flare-ups distract us from the real problems in the country. If we're if getting... Uh, a drone shot down for $130 million because the president is distracted, that's $130 million that we could be spending in places like Youngstown, Ohio, or Flint, Michigan, or, re that, or rebuilding, or Gellard, rebuilding. I'm going to give you 30 seconds, actually, to is jump off what he what said. He will, described is engagement that what as you the problem. will tell the parents of those two soldiers who were just killed in Afghanistan, well, we just have to be engaged. As a soldier, I will tell you, that answer is unacceptable. We have to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. We are in a place in Afghanistan where we have lost so many lives. We've spent so much money, money that's coming out of every one of our pockets, money that should be going into communities here at home, meeting the needs of the people here at home. We are no better off in Afghanistan today than we were when this war began. 
This is why it's so important to have a president and commander in chief who knows the cost of war and who's ready to do the job on day one. I am ready to do that job when I walk into the Oval Office. Thank you very much. Listen, I'm going to go down the line. I'm going to go down the. I'm going to go down the line. I'm going to go down the line here. Well, I, you know what? You felt I, you felt like she was responding. You get thirty Dr. seconds. Very go. Good man. Fair I enough. Appreciate that. I hear what you're saying. I would just say I don't want to be. I don't want to be engaged. I wish we were spending all this money in places that I've represented that have been completely forgotten, and we were rebuilding. But the reality of it is, if the United States isn't engaged, the Taliban will grow, and they will have bigger, bolder terrorist acts. We have got to have some present there. As, the as, the as Taliban was Iraq. there long before we came in. They'll yeah, be and they there were, long yeah, before we exactly. leave. Well, we cannot they were. keep U.S. And troops they were deployed flying. to Afghanistan thinking that we're going to somehow squash this Taliban I that has say, been there that I didn't every say other country squash that's them. tried I didn't say squash failed. them. When we weren't in there, they started flying planes into our buildings. So I'm just saying right now, the we Taliban have didn't oblig- attack us on the, 9-11. Al Qaeda did. Well, I understand. Al Qaeda attacked us on 9-11. I understand. That's why I and so I many understand. other people joined the military to go I after Al Qaeda, not the Taliban. The Taliban. The Go Taliban ahead, Tyson, finish up 10 was seconds. protecting those people who were plotting against us. All I'm saying is, if we want to go in to elections and we want to say that we got to withdraw from the world, that's what President Trump is saying. We okay. can't. I would you love know for who's us to. protecting right. Al Qaeda right now. I want to go Saudi down. Saudi Arabia. <laughs> That was so embarrassing for Tim Ryan. Like, he wasn't doing terribly throughout this debate, uh, but when he got that wrong and she called him out for it, I cringed for him because that's a moment you don't want to have. If you're trying to compete to be commander-in-chief, these really simple details here, you just don't want to mess them up. And... She knows her shit when it comes to foreign policy. She's the best on this issue out of everyone. And when she strikes, she strikes hard. So we got a glimpse of how powerful Tulsi Gabbard could be. I want to see more of this because we need all of these hawks in the Democratic Party who are pushing for intervention. And what he was pushing for was effectively never-ending war in Afghanistan. We need these people to be exposed as the hawks that they are. So Tulsi Gabbard here, she did phenomenally well. And I am so glad that this moment happened. Um, This was undoubtedly the best moment of the night for her. One of my favorite moments of the entire debate because it was that great. This was probably, besides all of the collective shitting on Beto, the, you know, one of the biggest moments of the night in terms of destroying someone. Like, if you want to come up with that cliche, X gets destroyed by Y in epic debate, this was basically that moment where somebody, they legitimately got destroyed and Tulsi handed him his ass. It was so glorious. Um, Thank you, Tulsi, for that. I truly enjoyed every moment of it. However, someone who didn't enjoy <laughs> Tim Ryan getting destroyed is Tim Ryan, because immediately after the debate was over, his team put out this statement about the exchange. Quote, while making a point as to why America can't cede its international leadership and retreat from around the world, Tim was interrupted by Representative Tulsi Gabbard. When he tried to answer her, she contorted a factual point Tim was making about the Taliban being complicit in the 9-11 attacks by providing training bases and refuge for Al-Qaeda and its leaders. The characterization that Tim Ryan doesn't know who is responsible for the attacks of 9-11 is simply unfair reporting. Further, we continue to reject Gabbard's isolationism and her misguided beliefs on foreign policy. We refuse to be lectured by someone who thinks it's okay to dine with murderous dictators like Syria's Bashar al-Assad, who used chemical weapons on his own people. Now, on top of that, he told a reporter, I personally don't need to be lectured by someone who's dining with the dictator who gassed kids. Now, he's clearly angry and he's literally going out of his way to smear Tulsi Gabbard because she owned him, and he's being an incredibly sore loser. But I think that nothing will summarize the situation better than this. You just got owned, you noob. You just got owned, motherfucker. You just got, you just got, you just got owned. You just got owned, you noob. You just got owned, motherfucker. You just got, you just got, you just got owned. (laughs) (laughs) 
So there were a couple of moments in the first night of the first Democratic Party debate of 2020 that really stood out. And one moment that I want to talk about is the moment where Julian Castro butted heads with Beto O'Rourke over an immigration policy that Beto refuses to support. Because Beto, he speaks Spanish, he purports to be an ally. However, as you're going to see here, Julian Castro is going to call him out on his bullshit. Some of us on this stage have called to end that section, to terminate it. Some, like Congressman O'Rourke, have not. And I want to challenge all of the candidates to do that. I, I just think it's a mistake, Bethel. I think it's a mistake. And I think that, that if you truly want to change the system, then we got to repeal that section. If not, Thank you. then it so might as well be the same policy. Let, let, let me very respond quickly. to this very briefly. Since Actually, as a member of Congress, I helped to introduce legislation that would ensure that we don't criminalize those who are seeking asylum and refuge I'm in this country. If you're about, fleeing, if you're fleeing desperation, asylum, then I'm I want to make about, sure, I'm I want to make about sure everybody that you're treated else. with respect. I'm still talking about everybody but, else. But you're looking at just one small part of this. I'm talking about a comprehensive rewrite of our immigration that's laws. That's not true. And if we do that, I don't think it's asking too much not for true. people I'm to talking follow about, our laws I'm when they come to this I'm talking about millions country. of folks. A lot of folks that are coming are not seeking asylum. A lot of them are undocumented immigrants, right? And you said recently that the reason you didn't want to repeal Section 1325 was because uh, you were concerned about human trafficking and, and drug trafficking. But let me tell you what. Section 18, uh, Title 18 of the U.S. Code, Title 21, and Title 22 already cover if human trafficking. Right. I think that you should do your homework, sure do your homework on this issue. If you did your homework on this issue, you would know that we should repeal this like section. This is an issue. Now, here's why that mattered. If you're Beto O'Rourke and you're trying to convince us that you have human empathy and you're a compassionate person and these immigrants should be treated as human beings, then... The fact that you're not supporting the repeal of 1325 is unforgivable. It shows that you are full of shit. Elizabeth Warren supports it. Um, I believe Bernie supports it as well. But here's why what Julian Castro did there was important. Let me tell you about 1325. As Dara Lind of Vox explains, it's the section of Title VIII of the United States Code that makes it a misdemeanor for immigrants to enter the United States without papers. Castro wants to get rid of it so that being an unauthorized immigrant in the United States would still be a civil offense, but no longer a federal crime. And he's pushing the rest of the Democratic field to join him. Elizabeth Warren already has endorsed the repeal of the illegal entry provision. Even moderate Tim Ryan implied he'd be open to the repeal during Wednesday's debate. Beto O'Rourke, who has an aggressive immigration plan of his own, was the only candidate who refused in a Democratic primary that has shown the party has shifted leftward on several issues since the Obama administration, this exchange was still remarkable. In fiscal year 2016, immigration offenses, illegal entry, and re-entry, chief among them, made up a majority of federal criminal prosecutions in 2019. As a result of Castro's hectoring on the debate stage, the Democratic presidential field debated for several minutes whether it should be a crime at all. So this is important because even if I have a lot of disagreements with Julian Castro, I think overall he is not very left wing when it comes to economic issues, or at least he hasn't proven that he genuinely supports policies like Medicare for All, even if he claims he does. I think that what he's doing here is important because he's still shifting the Overton window to the left on this issue of immigration. And we need to do that because the Overton window when it comes to immigration in this country has shifted so far to the right that people were willing to elect someone who was openly supporting fascistic policies in 2016. That's a sign that as a country, we've got to do better, we've got to course correct. And Julian Castro here, even if I don't support him overall, even if I disagree with him on a lot, he's doing a service to everyone. And by calling Beto on his bullshit, he's certainly doing something that I think a lot of people who um, <laughs> support anyone else can uh, get behind. So I wanted to highlight that because this was a good learning experience. My one criticism with Castro is that he should have explained this maybe a little bit more thoroughly, but when you don't have much time, so long as you get that number out there, you give people the chance to Google it and learn about 1325 and why we should repeal it. So overall, this was a great moment and I really wanted to share this with you because I think it's important. Towards the end of the first night of the first Democratic Party debate of 2020, Chuck Todd posed a question to the candidates that I found pretty curious. He asked them who they thought was the biggest geopolitical threat 
to the United States. Now, I take issue with the framing of this question because it assumes that we have threats that are comparable in any way to the threat that we pose to other countries. And it assumes that, you know, maybe the United States military industrial complex is justified in occupying numerous countries at once and having 900 military bases. So the connotations of this are, are they're, they're negative. I don't like it. And I don't like that Chuck Todd asked this question. However, with that being said, if you're savvy, you can retool this question in a way that is not militaristic or inherently hawkish. Some candidates did this. Other candidates, not so much. So in my view, I'm saying one of two things. If you ask me what the biggest geopolitical threat or national security threat is to the United States, I'm either saying nuclear proliferation or climate change or both. Now, since you can't um, choose two things, since they said pick one, I probably would have said climate change, but saying nuclear proliferation, that will also suffice. Some of them, though, wow. Horrible, horrible responses. Take a look. What is the biggest threat to what is Who is the geopolitical threat to the United States? Just give me a one word answer, Congressman Delaney. <clears throat> Can you repeat the question? Greatest question? geopolitical threat to the United States right now, Congressman Delaney? Well, the biggest uh, geopolitical challenge is China, but the okay. biggest geopolitical threat yes. remains nuclear weapons. Okay. Right? So those are, di you know, those are different you. questions. Totally get it. Go ahead, Governor Inslee. The biggest threat to the security of the United States is Donald Trump. And there's no question. Okay. Congresswoman Gabbard. The greatest, greatest geopolitical threat. The greatest threat that we face is the fact that we are at a greater risk of nuclear okay. war today than ever before in history. Cong Cong uh, Senator Two Klobuchar. threats, economic threat, China, but our, our major threat right now is what's going on in the Mideast with Iran if we don't get okay. our Okay, try to keep it at one, or, or slimmer, slimmer than what we've been going here. One or two our, words. Our please. existential threat is climate change. We have to confront it before it's too late. Senator Warner. Yeah. Change. Yeah, Senator Booker. Nuclear proliferation and climate change. Secretary uh, Castro. Say, uh, China and climate change. Uh, Congressman Ryan. China, without a question, they're wiping us around the world economically. Yeah. Uh, and Mr. Mayor. Russia, because they're trying to undermine our democracy, and they've been doing a pretty damn good job of it, and we need to stop them. All right. Well, thank you for uh, that wide variety of answers, and, and I mean that. No, I mean that in a, that's what this debate is about. Okay, so I have my notes with me. First of all, I said this in the overall debate breakdown video, but if you are Jay Inslee, the answer is climate change. I expected him to say climate change. He said Donald Trump. Now, you definitely can make the case that Donald Trump is the United States' biggest geopolitical threat just because he is so belligerent. But if I'm the climate change guy, I'm not saying Donald Trump. I'm saying climate change. So I expected better from him. Here's the people who got it right. Tulsi Gabbard answered nuclear war. That's correct. Beto says climate change. Correct. Elizabeth Warren says climate change. Cory Booker says climate change and nuclear proliferation. Okay, you can only pick one and you stole that from the other candidates, from Tulsi and Warren. But regardless, I'll let it pass. Um, here's where we start getting into iffy territory. Um, the first person who responded, John Delaney, and um, he said China. Really? You think China is a geopolitical threat to the United States? Tim Ryan also said China. They're going to pass us economically. And you can make the argument that, you know, whenever a country amasses wealth economically and they become an international powerhouse, sure, that means that they're also probably going to simultaneously build up their military. But to say China, it's just tone deaf. Now, here's the worst answer. The person who I thought won the debate overall, Bill de Blasio, gave the worst answer. He said, Russia. He said Russia. <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst answer um, by a mile and a half. And if you're going to give that answer, because we know that he doesn't believe that, he's just pandering, 
Um, as I think Natalie Shore said on Twitter, you're pandering to people who are completely unreasonable within the Democratic Party, like the Rachel Maddow supporters and whatnot. Um, but look, if you're going to say that, then why haven't you proposed a plan that stops Russia from interfering in our elections? You can opt for paper ballots. You can opt for increasing cybersecurity. You can have an Election Integrity Act. Tulsi Gabbard has been a leader here. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, I believe, just proposed her own plan. But if you're not coming up with that, then we know you're just pandering when you say Russia. So, by and large, the question itself was troubling. But as I stated earlier, you can kind of rework this to make it fit your progressive narrative. You don't have to you know, take the hawkish implications and build off of that. You can kind of make it your own. I think Tulsi, Beto, and Warren, and Booker, to be fair, they did that. The others, no, they bought into this notion that, you know, there are really um, large geopolitical threats to the United States when that's just not true. International U.S. hegemony is a thing. Nobody's a threat to us. We're a threat to everyone else. If... There's going to be a threat to international peace and stability. It's going to be the United States. So as president, what I want to hear is that you're going to rein that in. And some of these candidates, Tim Ryan, John Delaney, didn't give us that. Uh, and that's incredibly disappointing because if you're running to be the Democratic Party nominee and you're not explicitly anti-war, what are you doing? What are you doing? So that's all I got to say about this. Uh, Bill de Blasio, the winner... But that was a very bad moment for him, in spite of an overall very strong performance. So we've got one debate down and one more to go. So this is my pre-debate analysis for night two. And basically, I'm going to say the same thing that I think probably everyone is thinking. This is going to be a debate primarily between Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. This is the Biden-Bernie show, and it would behoove any other candidate to insert themselves into that conversation, into that rivalry, and try to have a breakout moment. Because we all know that when you have the two frontrunners pitted against each other, that's basically going to pave the way for some fireworks. But if you can jump in there and either shit on one of those two front runners, you could potentially make a name for yourself. But what I'm expecting from Joe Biden, I'm very conflicted because on one hand, we know that he's a gaffe machine and he keeps speaking and pissing people off with every single word that he says. However, with that being said, I'm not going to say that he's an incompetent debater. So just based on performance, not substance, he could come out relatively okay. It's hard to predict. Bernie Sanders, I think, is going to perform well. I think he's got to hit Biden and hit Biden hard and constantly because Bernie knows this is a debate between him and Biden. He's got to make it happen. So in terms of what Bernie Sanders' method of attack should be, he's got to push electability because that's what they're pushing against him. He's got to make the case. Look, we went with the centrist last time. That's what Joe Biden is trying to position himself as. Do you really want to do that again? Do you really want to roll the dice? Or do you want to go with someone like me who energizes the base, energizes independents and young voters? If he can do that, he will win this entire debate. So that's what we have to see. Bernie hitting Biden hard. And for any other candidate, any of the eight other candidates, if you can get some attention and take it away from Biden and Bernie, you can be relatively successful. When it comes to Andrew Yang, I think he's going to have the easiest time because all he has to do is stay the course. If he has at least a minute to pitch UBI, that could help him. If he doesn't get that minute, which I doubt he, he'll you know be completely excluded, but if he doesn't at least get a minute to pitch UBI, I think that's going to really hurt him. This could potentially help him. I think that for Andrew Yang, he's been slowly rising in the polls, and this could potentially be a breakout moment. He's definitely someone I'm watching. When it comes to Marianne Williamson, She's got to come with policy. Every time I hear her speak, it's platitudes. It's about love. Listen, if you don't come out swinging with policy, you're not going to go anywhere. Because even if she is someone who politically I agree with more than someone like, you know, uh, Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg even, she never talks policy. Ever. People don't know what she stands for. So she's got to put those platitudes aside come out swinging when it comes to policy, when it comes to Pete Buttigieg. You know, he had his moment in the spotlight. 
Now this is his chance for redemption. He's got to shine because he's been taking a beating because of the way that he handled a police shooting of a black American in South Bend, Indiana. He's got to try to redeem himself. He's got to communicate to people that he is sensitive to black issues. He's got to make a comeback if he wants any staying power, if he wants to perform well at Iowa. So I wouldn't say that this is make or break for him because I think he'll probably qualify for the next round of debates. But with that being said, what we're looking for with regard to Pete Buttigieg is potential redemption. Um, who else is going tomorrow? We have Gillibrand. When it comes to Gillibrand, what she needs to do and the way that she could potentially move up is if she outshines one of the other corporate Democrats. If she can outshine Pete Buttigieg, I think she's positioning herself well because she's been kind of overshadowed by these breakout stars like Pete Buttigieg and even Kamala Harris, but to a lesser extent. So if she can kind of slide in there and make herself known for something and get her word across, this could potentially help her. If she doesn't break out here, then I think it's not going to go too well, you know, um, for the for the rest of the primary. When it comes to Kamala Harris, this is a bit tricky because what she needs to do is, since she is, I think, arguably one of the front runners, she needs to attack the person who she is positioned against. So she's trying to be a progressive. She's been very strong on Medicare for all. Not sure that I'm persuaded she'd actually fight for it, nonetheless. You know, she's positioning herself as progressive. So what does she have to do? She needs to be an attack dog against Joe Biden. Tag team with Bernie Sanders. Her and Bernie should team up for purposes of this debate to bring down Joe Biden. And once they basically eliminate Joe Biden politically, or, you know, once he goes down enough in the polls, then they can clash with each other. But I want to see a ceasefire between Bernie and Harris because they're so close that it's in both of their interests to attack their mutual enemy, and that is Joe Biden. So if Kamala Harris does that, that's how I think she can win, although she does have to kind of stay the course in the sense that she doesn't want to be outshined by someone like Kirsten Gillibrand, who is ideologically kind of aligned with her, although a lot of Democrats don't like Gillibrand because of the Al Franken situation. She called on him to step down. She was one of the first to do that. And I don't know, like, of all things to be frustrated with her about, you know, it's the it's the Wall Street fundraisers. It's the fundraisers at the home of a Pfizer executive, big pharma executives. That's what I'm pissed about. I'm not angered that she cut out Al Frank, and I actually commend her for that, because going against the Democratic Party is something that they will never forgive you for. So I'm not worried about that, and maybe they may never forgive her because they're just holding a grudge. But with that being said, Kamala does need to be cognizant of the fact that Kirsten Gillibrand could outshine her. Now, here's when it comes to a more tricky area. We have Michael Bennett, Eric Swalwell, and John Hickenlooper. These people are about as interesting as wallpaper. The only one out of these three that I can entertain even standing out is Eric Swalwell because he was smart enough to realize that he's got to pick one issue as his kind of go-to and he chose gun reform. So if he can really dwell on that and drive that narrative, he could break out, but it's going to be tough. John Hickenlooper, Michael Bennett, these guys don't stand for anything. Michael Bennett is someone who has been attacking Medicare for all. John Hickenlooper has also been attacking Medicare for all. And he's so pathetic that He's, in a way, I guess you could say, trolling Bernie Sanders by, like, responding to Bernie Sanders' tweets with his own campaign ads as to why Bernie's wrong. It's pathetic. So, here's what I would um, <laughs> perceive to be successful for these people. If they can talk longer than, like, a couple minutes and maybe more than once, then I think if our standards are that low, it would be a success for them. But either way, I don't think that these debates will serve them well. I think that they're just... If somebody is opting for a centrist during this primary, you're going for Joe Biden. So I'm not sure what their place is, and I don't even think they know what their place is. But if they do, they've got to make that pitch tonight, and they've got to make it boldly and aggressively. Otherwise, they're done. Stick a fork in them. You've got like 20 centrists running <laughs> in a field of so many candidates. I I'm being, you know, um, hyperbolic, of course, but you've got already a ton of centrists. So if you're not proposing something unique if you're not pitching a brand of centrism that is superior you're done so that's what they've got to do john hickenlooper 
Honestly, I don't like to make predictions. I like to kind of draw out certain types of scenarios that I think could happen. But if I had to make a prediction, if anyone's going to face plant, it's going to be John Hickenlooper. He just has zero charisma. And I really, really want someone to bring up the fact that he watched porn with his mom. Uh, 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 a, uh, uh, Who I'm rooting for, you all know. It's Bernie Sanders. So long as he can pitch policies that are popular and progressive and shit on Joe Biden enough, that will be a success for Bernie Sanders. And really what this should be is the shit on Biden show. Everyone needs to attack the front runner because if you all collectively attack the front runner, that's not going to make it seem as if you are unilaterally going negative. If everyone is going negative, you have no reason not to go negative. So they all have a vested interest in attacking the front runner. Now, with that being said, I'm aware of the fact that if they all bring down Joe Biden, they're going to turn their attention to Bernie Sanders because that's what you do in these primary fights. You attack the front runner. But Bernie Sanders has already been undergoing these attacks. Um, for lack of a better word, he's battle tested. And I think that he can actually kind of stop some of their attacks. I don't know that Joe Biden will be as persuasive at doing that. I'd expect him to be called out for reminiscing about how you know nice and personable these segregationists that he worked with were. But that's what I'm looking for. It's got to be an all-out war on Joe Biden. If I can get that, then I will come away satisfied. But I'm looking for, you know, Bernie Sanders to shine more so than anyone else. But if any other candidate can kind of break into that Biden-Bernie fight, I think that will be a success for them. The second night of the first 2020 Democratic Party primary debate is officially over and I have quite a bit of thoughts running through my head, although I think that I've collected my thoughts enough to where I can certainly distinguish between who I think are the winners and who are the losers. And I think that the outcome overall, it, I feel like I'm surprised, but at the same time, I'm not surprised. There were certain people who I knew would do well. There were other people who I thought would probably fail, but some people did, in fact, surprise me. And people surprised me for both good and bad reasons. So we're going to get to all of that. I'm going to give you my general breakdown. We'll talk about some statistics first as we started with last night. When it comes to talk time, Joe Biden clocked in a total of 13.6. He's polling the highest and he got the most talk time. You have Kamala and Bernie along with Pete Buttigieg coming in second, third, and fourth place respectively with about an equal amount of talk time. And then you had the rest of the candidates... Um, you know, not doing too well. Andrew Yang got the least amount of talk time with three minutes. Now, usually you would think that if you have the most talk time, that's certainly an advantage. However, with Joe Biden, it's a disadvantage because we all know, even his own advisors know that the more he speaks, the more likely he is to turn away voters. So if I'm Joe Biden, I'm not going to butt in on that stage. I'm going to keep my mouth shut unless I'm invoked or called on. And I think he probably tried to emulate that strategy. But when you're pulling ahead and you're the front runner, you're going to talk. You're going to have to face Americans. And um, boy, did that hurt him. And I'm kind of spoiling who I think one of the losers is. But um, not a good night for him. But before we get into the specifics, because I'm certainly ready to talk about that, let me show you this graph. Uh, it talks about how many times Donald Trump was invoked. And predictably, the front runners did, in fact, invoke him the most. You have Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, all invoking Donald Trump the most. And again, as I stated last night, I think that this is a strategy that's good because it shows that you're confident. It shows that you are not afraid to speak out against the opponent who you may be facing this early. So that's important. So getting into who i thought the winners and the losers were i'm gonna break this down into four different categories as i did last night there's a category for the losers there's a category that i will place people in that i call meh because they weren't necessarily great didn't do bad um and then there is the they did good category they did okay you know they didn't do bad they weren't standouts but they performed you know in a passably good way. And then we have the winner category, although I do think that there is one clear winner and one clear loser. Last night, I thought that it was evident that Bill de Blasio was kind of the breakout star and the overall clear winner, but this, this debate really had one clear standout. 
that I think is probably going to get a boost in the polls because of how well this individual performed. But we're going to do that last. First, let's talk about the losers. Biggest loser, first of all, unquestionably, is Joe Biden. Unquestionably. Because if you're the front runner, you have the most to lose. You have the most to lose. So you have got to expect all of these attacks. It was evident to me that he was completely unprepared, unequipped to rebut any of these attacks. And it hurt him badly. He's already been sliding. This didn't help him at all. And one moment in the debate that was so powerful was when Kamala Harris challenged him on segregation. If he drops out, I believe that a lot of us will look to that moment as the beginning of the end of his campaign. That's how powerful I think that was and how detrimental that was to Biden's campaign. And it was so bad that as he was trying to explain himself, he just cut himself off and said, oh, my time's up. I agree that everybody wants they in fact, they should. Anyway, my time's up. I'm sorry. Now, if you're a normal candidate, you're not going to ever want to stop talking. You're going to talk as long as you possibly can until they cut you off. Now, again, Joe Biden doesn't want to exercise the same strategy, but there's a caveat there. If you're in the defense, if you're backed into a corner, you don't cut yourself off. He did that. It was a bad look. But even though Joe Biden, I think, was the biggest loser, I did put other candidates in this category as well. In the loser category, I placed John Hickenlooper, who I think is the second biggest loser, because he really had nothing of value to add to the conversation. He just kept trying to attack socialism because that's his thing, I guess. And he, it was mentioned that he was booed at a Democratic Party convention when he attacked socialism. So that didn't work well for you, but he's still choosing to utilize the same strategy. I mean, <laughs> if you thought that, you know, this was going to be your moment, John, I've got bad news for you. It wasn't. Now, for the next person who I'm placing in the loser category, it kind of hurts me to do this because I didn't actually expect this person to perform this badly. And I'm going to kind of contradict what I said in my pre-debate analysis. I'm going to have to place Andrew Yang in this category. He got the least amount of talk time. And what I said in my pre-debate analysis was that all he needs to do, essentially, I think, you know, he's going to have the easiest time because all he needs is to get his point across about UBI. He needs enough time to pitch it, like a minute, and he'll do well. Well, seeing that play out and seeing how much of a non-entity he was, I just don't think this debate did him any favors at all. I think he needed a breakout moment, and where I went wrong was that I thought he would just automatically have that breakout moment if he got a chance to pitch UBI, but seeing it in action, it just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, so I was wrong about that, and he's got to do more. Okay, that's my losers. I have Biden, Hickenlooper, and Yang. Moving on to the meh category. I have two people. Eric Swalwell and Michael Bennett. Now, Michael Bennett barely made it out of the loser category, but because he chose to hit Biden on tax cuts that benefited the Tea Party at the end there, he did it for himself. He got himself out of the loser category, but with that being said, he was pretty much a non-entity throughout this debate, and he was just one of those I'm against policies X, Y, and Z candidates like John Hickenlooper. And you just have to come with something unique. And he didn't do that. Now, Eric Swalwell, he is someone who, he was originally also in the loser category. And I'll be honest with you, I hated him throughout this debate. He was incredibly smarmy and smug. And basically his entire pitch was, I'm young, vote for me. Dude, what are you bringing to the table? That was my question. And finally, he talked about what he's bringing, gun reform. That's great. Um, but I don't know that he was knowledgeable about any other issue. Overall, again, like I said, he was just so smarmy that every time he spoke, it was a turnoff. He came across as a really rehearsed, focus group driven, thumb pointing politician. However, one moment that was great for him that I don't want to give him credit for because it was bad for Bernie was when he kind of went after Bernie 
when um, it comes to gun reform. Now, he went after Bernie on age. He said, pass the torch when it comes to, I forgot what the issue was, but Bernie said, no, the issue is taking on these special interests. That's the answer, not pass the torch. And Bernie was right about that. But where he actually got Bernie is where he was pushing Bernie on a gun buyback program for automatic assault weapons. Um, and he said, listen, do you support a gun buyback program. And Bernie then said, well, if the government wants to do that, I'd support that. And where Swalwell hit him was when he said, well, you will be the government if you're president. That was not a good look for Bernie. And Bernie should have been prepared on this issue because we saw back in 2016, that's what the Democrats and media hit him on was guns. So he should have came prepared. And Eric Swalwell exploited that perceived weakness, and I don't think it worked out in Bernie's favor. Now, with that being said, Bernie isn't a bad performer here, but that moment was a low light for me and for Bernie, and unfortunately, it helped out Eric Swalwell, I think, because going after the front runner is a smart strategy. Um, getting to the good category. The first person is Pete Buttigieg. The second person is Marianne Williamson, even if I think she was all over the place, but I think she settled in the good category. But first, let me talk about Pete Buttigieg. What I said going into this debate was he needed um, a redemption performance here. He needed to stand out. Did he do that? I don't think he did. However, he didn't do a bad job. He spoke intelligently about certain issues, and even though I disliked some of the answers that he gave, the crowd seemed into what he was talking about, and I think he said things that will play well with the Democratic Party base. So I just think he did good. Um, I personally wasn't a fan, but putting my bias aside, just objectively speaking and basing this off of performance, I think that he performed well. Marianne Williamson, she really, she performed in the way that I honestly expected Andrew Yang to perform, because as someone who has no name recognition, You've got to get in there. You've got to insert your name in there. And what I said in my pre-debate analysis was, I need her to bring the policies and not just love. And she brought both. And we'll get into the specifics about her love um, agenda. But um, she kept jumping in. She hit some of the candidates. She brought up some really great points. Other points made me cringe incredibly hard. Um, the moment, let me tell you this, the moment when she very seriously looked at the camera and spoke to Donald Trump directly and said, Mr. President, I'm, I'm going, going to harness, harness love for political purposes. I will meet you on that field. And sir, love will win. Oh! I wanted to jump out of my fucking skin. That made me cringe so hard, but simultaneously, I was laughing to the point where I almost had tears in my eyes. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Getting to the winners here. There's three left, so you know who the winners are. In this category, Bernie Sanders, Kirsten Gillibrand, and Kamala Harris. Kirsten Gillibrand was in the meh category for a large portion of the debate, but towards the end, she shot up. In terms of performance, she started talking, inserting herself into conversations where she had knowledge and value to add. And where she really was strong and just shined was when she talked about corruption. She brought up publicly financed elections and talked about how you need to get rid of the money in politics. And she didn't add the dark money caveat. She said, full stop, get rid of money. And then you could proceed to other issues because the money in politics is what's preventing progress. Very, very strong. She came off as someone who was knowledgeable. She came off as someone who did her homework. Parts of her answer seemed overly rehearsed, and I think that she's got to work on that. But overall, I think she performed well, and I wouldn't be surprised if she got a bump in the polls. Now, when it comes to Bernie Sanders, he started out incredibly strong. He ended incredibly strong. But here's the thing, Bernie Sanders, in my opinion, kind of had the same issue that Elizabeth Warren had, where you're one of the front runners, and you technically don't have to do much. All you have to do is maintain, and once the field kind of thins out, then you start to take off the gloves. So, you know, don't go out of your way to attack and come off as vindictive if you don't have to. However, there's a line between, you know, being overly vindictive and playing it too safe. I think Bernie ultimately erred on the side of playing it a little bit too safe. Like, when he attacked Joe Biden for his vote on the Iraq War, 
That was a powerful moment, but it was so short and we needed more of it. And furthermore, when you see how much of an influence Bernie Sanders has on all of these candidates to where they're influenced by his policies, where what he's been pushing and popularizing over the last couple of years is brought up constantly at these debates, for him to not brag about that and brag about how he influenced it, I think he's doing a disservice to himself. Now, even if he was strong, and I think he did a good, perf he, did, he performed well, I kind of hold him to a higher standard in terms of debate performance because I think he's just such an excellent debater and he is an effective communicator simply because he comes across as authentic. But I think at this next debate, because there was someone who was such a breakout star, he does need to do more. I loved that him and Kamala Harris kind of tag teamed each other on Medicare for All. It's important for them to team up for now while they take out the bigger targets. But later on, him and Kamala can go head to head and butt heads. But for now, I like both of their strategies. So Bernie performed well. He was he was pretty solid. However, there's one clear winner in this debate. And even if I desperately, desperately wanted it to be Bernie Sanders, objectively, if I'm basing this on performance and not who I agree with more overall, I don't even think it was a question. Kamala Harris won this debate, hands down. And not only did she win, I think this is one of the best debate performances I've seen in quite some time. She won basically both nights. That's how strong I think her performance is. Now, that's not me endorsing her policies. That's not me endorsing her as a politician. That's me saying that in terms of sheer debate performance, she absolutely did enough to where I wouldn't be surprised if she started to pass Elizabeth Warren possibly Bernie in the polls, simply because her performance was so strong. And in this debate, she may have single-handedly taken down Joe Biden. I'm impressed. I'm absolutely impressed. And if you listen to lefty political commentators, back when she announced, we were all saying, watch out for Kamala Harris. I know Kyle Kalinske said it. Emma Viglin said it. A lot of us said it because... When you recognize that raw political talent, just in terms of being a skilled orator, in terms of being able to effectively communicate a message and demonstrate knowledge and passion, she has it. She has it. Credit where it's due. You can't deny her that. So Kamala Harris, the clear winner, um, better than Bill de Blasio, and she's the one to look out for. And even if I think that her and Bernie should team up currently, he may have to turn his sights to her and start going on offense sooner rather than later because as this um, field thins, which probably won't substantially happen until after Iowa, but after the first couple of debates, it wouldn't be you know impossible to imagine some candidates dropping out. But as the field thins, she's going to stand out more and she's going to start cutting in to Bernie and Elizabeth Warren's territory. Now, the progressives in my audience, we know the difference between a real progressive and someone who just knows that they have to be and present themselves as progressives for purposes of political expediency, but the general population isn't going to be able to tell the difference. That's why Bernie, I think he's going to have to step up and not necessarily attack. You don't have to attack or be vindictive, but you need to differentiate yourself. You need to say, look, this... Support that we're seeing for Medicare for All. Who did that? I did that. Nobody wanted to talk Medicare for All until I talked about it. Nobody started to talk about issues X, Y, and Z until I popularized these issues. He's going to have to do that because Kamala is a very strong candidate. She's no Hillary Clinton. She's no Joe Biden. She is someone who's solid. And I can see her outlasting the likes of Pete Buttigieg as well. So that is, you know, the winners, the losers and whatnot. Let me get to some specific moments. So the debate opened with Kamala Harris just impressing me right off the bat. Um, she was asked, how do we pay for all these progressive policy proposals that people like you and Bernie support? And immediately she had the right answer. She flipped it. I didn't hear the media ask Donald Trump how they're going to pay for tax cuts for the rich. That's exactly what we have been telling politicians to say. And it's part of the reason why I'm impressed with her. She also talked about the economy and how Donald Trump brags about how good the economy is, but he always references how well stock markets are doing when most people don't even have stock. So, of course, that's not a good indicator. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, he said a lot of things that made him seem smart, but in actuality, if you know your shit, you know 
that he's being disingenuous. So he talked about why he doesn't support free college, because he believes in, you know, a prototypical uh, neoliberal version of free college. Oh, let's make it free, but let's means test it. He also used the same line that Amy Klobuchar used last night. He said, I don't want to pay for college for rich kids. Rich kids are not going to go to publicly funded universities. They're going to go to private schools. Stop saying this because it's very clear that you're lying. He also, um, he said that whenever somebody says Medicare for all, whenever, whenever that word leaves a candidate's lips, they need to explain how to get to Medicare for all. Now he says this and he thinks he's saying something that's so profound, but it's not profound. Stop overcomplicating it. The way that you get to Medicare for All is you pass Medicare for All. That's exactly what you do. Pass it, four years later it gets implemented. Now, I would opt for Jayapal's bill over Bernie's bill because that has a two-year rollout as opposed to Bernie's four-year rollout, but that is the quickest way. Now, since we're on the subject of healthcare, I want to continue here because we had Joe Biden and Michael Bennett say, you know, the quickest way, the way that they're pitching it is the quickest way to get to universal care, of course, is to build on the ACA. But again, that doesn't even make sense. You're building on something, so you implement it, you wait a few years, you you know add something else. That's not how you get to universal coverage. That's factually incorrect, and it's logically inconceivable. If you want Medicare for all, if you want universal care more specifically, which is the buzzword they use, then you pass Medicare for all. It's that simple. Anyone who says that, anyone who says access, please understand they are bullshitting you. And while we're still on the subject of healthcare, the question again was posed to the candidates about whether or not they want to get rid of private health insurance. Again, to Kamala's credit, she raised her hand and not surprising you know, to anyone, Bernie Sanders also raised his hand and they both declared boldly so that they want to get rid of private health insurance companies. Now, Kamala can't get too much credit here because she did waver before. At her first CNN town hall, she said, let's get rid of them. And then less than 24 hours later, she backtracked. But I mean, regardless, I'll give her credit here because it is important to commit to that if you want a really robust Medicare for all system. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying my post-debate analysis. I am in the process of editing the video that you're watching now. So I'm coming to you from the future. Um, however, as I'm trying to Google the article so I can show you when Kamala Harris flip-flopped when it comes to the question of eliminating private insurance, look what I found. She literally flip-flopped again, hours later, faster than she flip-flopped before. So let me recap. <laughs> At her first scene in town hall, she was asked if she should get rid of, if we should get rid of private health insurance companies. She said, yes, get rid of them. And then she backtracked. She was asked again, raise your hand if you want to get rid of private insurance companies. And she says, yes. And she flip flops again. This wishy-washiness on Medicare for All is definitely a weakness that we will have to exploit as progressives. Now, what's funny is I actually want to play a little bit of a clip from the last time when I was editing a video talking about Kamala Harris, because in the last time I talked about her CNN Town Hall, she flip-flopped so fast then that I literally had to do another one of these segments where I kind of cut in while I'm editing to tell you that she flip-flopped that fast where I couldn't get it into this video. But I'm in the process of editing this video and I can't even finish editing the video and I find out this, that Kamala Harris already backtracked. <laughs> I mean, like, you can't make this shit up. So I get it. This is getting confusing because this is a video within a video within a video. This is extremely meta. But just so you know, just so we're clear, Kamala flip-flopped on eliminating private health insurance for a second time. You've got to know the details of Medicare for all and where you stand. So um, this is a big deal. So certainly keep in mind that I gave her a lot of credit here. You've got to take some of that away. Um, but with that being said, <laughs> back to um, you know the uh, post-debate analysis. We'll talk more about this later, I'm sure. Now, moving on, uh, just a little random thing to throw in here. There was a moment that lasted about four to five seconds, but it was such an awkward moment, perhaps the most awkward moment of the night, besides Joe Biden basically saying I'm out of time. Um, it was when Eric Swaldwell asked Pete Buttigieg why he hasn't fired a racist police chief. 
Pete Buttigieg just simply stared at him and gave him the death glare, and it was so awkward. The tension was palpable, and I just had to point this out because this really stood out to me. Michael Bennett then played offense and attacked Bernie Sanders, saying, you know, he wants to ban every insurance company, and he wants to ban it for everything except for, you know, cosmetic procedures like plastic surgery. Now, that's so... That's such a stupid argument because nobody cares about their private insurance. We care about keeping our doctor. And the reason why we ban duplicative care is because it's already covered under Medicare for All. So we don't need a two-tiered system where the private companies can jump in and offer, you know, a plan that the government is already offering. So there's no need for anything but, you know, unless you want supplemental care for something like plastic surgery, which honestly, you're just going to finance anyway. So it's a non-issue that he's bringing up. It is a non-issue, but he thinks he's being profound. But then Kamala Harris jumped in and she kind of took the heat off of Bernie by saying this is an issue. This this is something that affects people. And she brought in a personal anecdote or not a personal anecdote, but a story about how, you know, the private health insurance companies are ripping people off. That was great. And predictably, Bernie Sanders was incredibly strong on the issue of healthcare. He's the best on this, hands down. He's the best on it. So, of course, he was great on this issue. Now, here is what I want to get into next. Immigration, because we had a really bright spot here for Marianne Williamson, because she did something that I rarely hear. She brought up how the reason why immigration is, is an issue and why people want to move here to begin with is because of U.S. foreign policy in Latin America. We destabilized these countries. We catalyzed these crises. That was great that she brought that up. That was huge. That was a very substantive point to make. Um, John Hickenlooper didn't have a good answer. He just uh, immediately went to platitudes when he was asked. Kamala gave a strong answer. Uh, I believe that Bernie Sanders also brought up Latin America. I would have liked him to explore that further, but kind of touching on, you know, why we need to get countries together in Latin America and we'll solve this together. But I think that Marianne Williamson hit the target a little bit better, but still Bernie's answer was good. And you have to touch on Latin America when you're talking about immigration, because our policies have destabilized a lot of Latin American countries directly and indirectly. And we have to address that. We need a president who will address that. Um, additionally, when it comes to the border, Buttigieg endorsed this idea, and I think all the candidates endorsed the idea, that we should end the criminalization of people who cross the border. And um, he then brought up religion. He then brought up religion. Now, I think this could be persuasive because you're essentially saying, well, Republicans can't use religion if they treat immigrants this way when that's against religion. But I don't want to hear about your religion. And it really seems like he's pandering to moderate voters when he does this. And he talks about, oh, we want the Christian left to rise. Yeah, that just, it turns me off every time I hear him say that. Um, moving on to Eric Swalwell. I'm going to summarize his performance for you um, in one quick sentence. Pass the torch, pass the torch, pass the torch. Whenever Bernie or Biden would say something, He'd say, pass the torch. And it came off as ageist, but then Marianne Williamson swooped in again and basically told him to eat shit and die. She said, just because you have a young body doesn't mean that you won't have old ideas. <laughs> that was so good. Marianne Williamson, this is why I put her in the good category. She then, speaking of Marianne Williamson, brought up reparations when talking about the issue of criminal justice. And she is the strongest on this issue. I loved the fact that on a national debate stage, a presidential candidate invoked reparations. This is awesome. This is, you know, it, it demonstrates the power that progressives have. We are moving the Overton window to the left. That's evidence of that. Now, Joe Biden, I'm going to summarize his entire performance. When he wasn't playing defense, when he was talking about his record and his accomplishments, this is about the way that he, he performed. Um, Mr. Vice President, you have 30 seconds to answer the question. Go. Okay. Obama, 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 Obama. How much time do I have left? Um, you have 10 seconds, sir. Perfect. Obama, 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 Obama. I'm done. My time's up. I'm sorry. It was all about Obama. Now, I get it. 
Hillary tried to do this strategy as well. But Kamala, she actually had a pretty strong strategy where she set herself apart and she said, look, this is where I disagreed with Obama's administration was when it comes to immigration. Because even if Obama and you were not as cruel as Donald Trump, obviously, they still had a lot of dr draconian aspects about their immigration policy. They had the alien transfer exit pro uh, program, which Kamala didn't bring up, but Obama had this. This was cruel. Is where you take, you know, an immigrant man, drop him off somewhere randomly in the country where he came from, which can potentially put them in danger, and you use this as, an, as a deterrent to dissuade people from coming. I hate that. It's cruel. On the subject of Yang, he hurt himself when he brought up how Russia is our greatest geopolitical threat because they hacked or stole our democracy. I don't like this talk because they didn't hack or steal our democracy. No voting booths were affected. There's no evidence that that's the case. Releasing the DNC emails, um, posting memes online, and in influencing you know the election in other social media centric ways, that's not tantamount to hacking the election. So the reason why that's bad is because you need to take responsibility as a party as to why you were wrong. And you can't just say that without proposing a solution like increasing cybersecurity, moving the paper ballots. Again, uh, Tulsi Gabbard was one of the first to come up with the solution here. Anybody who talks about how, you know, uh, Russia is such a big threat like Yang and Eric Swalwell, they haven't supported Tulsi's bill. So they shouldn't speak on this topic because they're they're not serious here. One moment that I did like was when Bernie Sanders said he'd bring countries together and he'd talk about the common enemy that we all have in climate change. Very powerful. John Hickenlooper, conversely, talked about bringing businesses together to attack climate change. So you're going to bring oil and gas companies together, in other words, and ask them how we can do something that will definitely cut into their profits. John Hickenlooper, I'm sorry, is a fucking gigantic dipshit. <laughs> He's just so bad. A weird moment for me was when Marianne Williamson, she said the first thing she'd do as president is she would call the Prime Minister of New Zealand and she would say... And I will tell her girlfriend you are so on because the United States of America is going Thanks. to be the best place in the world for a child to grow up. Miss you know That was such a weird moment, a really weird moment. And it would have been the weirdest moment of the night for Marianne Williamson had she not looked the camera in the eye and said, I'm gonna harness love politically. So this is why, you know, she was all over the place. Some moments were awesome where I loved it. Other moments had me scratching my head. By and large, Kamala Harris was definitely a winner. Joe Biden, definitely a loser. Bernie Sanders, he did what he needed to do in terms of maintaining, but next time, him and L Elizabeth Warren and Tulsi Gabbard, the progressives, need to step up a lot more because there's a lot of really great speakers in this race, like Kamala Harris and, to a much lesser extent, Cory Booker and Pete Buttigieg, and they're going to outshine some of the progressives if they don't start really getting forceful and elbowing their way you know, into the conversation more. But great debate, really entertaining two nights, informative, uh, much better than anything we've seen in the White House, I could tell you that. However, you know, we'll see how this plays out. It's still incredibly early. This is the first debate. And um, yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed my, uh, my coverage. So on night one of the first 2020 Democratic Party primary debate, we had what seemed to be a death blow. Tulsi Gabbard dismantled Tim Ryan in such a thorough and embarrassing way that that moment may have single-handedly tanked his campaign. Now, I did not think that lightning would strike twice. I didn't think we'd get the same moment in night two, but we did. And this moment surprisingly came from Kamala Harris, who called out Joe Biden, rightfully so, for recently talking about how personable segregationists were. Now, she started by sharing why she was bothered by the way he talked about segregation. Um, I do not believe you are a racist. And I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. Mm -hmm. But I also believe, and it's personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful 
to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. So I will tell you that on this subject, it cannot be an intellectual debate among Democrats. We have to take it seriously. We have to act swiftly. As Attorney General of California, I was very proud to put in place a, a requirement that all my special agents would wear body cameras and keep those cameras on. So that was really powerful. She shared her personal story. She called out Joe Biden specifically because he worked with segregationists to oppose busing, which is huge. That's a big deal. You're not teaming up with segregationists to stop a war or something. You're teaming up with them to do segregation. You're a segregationist. So she hit him on that, and that was really important. It was a powerful moment. His response crash and burn. He denied it and he didn't have a good response. And they butted heads and she absolutely got the better of him here. It's a mischaracterization of my position across the board. I did not praise racist. That is not true. Number one. Number two, if we want to have this campaign litigated on who supports civil rights and whether I did or not, I'm happy to do that. I was a public defender. I didn't become a prosecutor. I came out and I left a good law firm to become a public defender. When in fact, when in fact, when in fact my city was in flames because of the, the uh, assassination of Dr. King, number one. Now, number two, as the U.S., as, excuse me, as the uh, uh, Vice President of the United States, I work with a man who in fact, we worked very hard to see to it we dealt with these issues in a major, major way. The fact is that in terms of busing, the busing, I never, you would have been able to go to school the same exact way because it was a local decision made by your city council. That's fine. That's one of the things I argued for, that we should not be, we should be breaking down these lines. But so the bottom line here is, look, everything I've done in my career, I ran because of civil rights. I continue to think we have to make fundamental changes in civil rights. And those civil rights, by the way, include not just only African Americans, but the LGBT community. But they, uh, Vice President Biden, do you agree today, do you agree today that you were wrong to oppose busing in America then? No, do you agree? I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I opposed. Well, I there did was not a oppose. failure of, of states to, to integrate no, public schools in America. I was part of the, the second class to integrate Berkeley, the, California public schools almost two decades after Brown v. Board of Education. Because your city council made that decision. It was a so local decision. So that's where the federal government must step the, in. The that's why we have the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. That's why we need to pass the Equality Act. That's why we need to pass the ERA, because that's there what, are moments in history where states fail to preserve the civil rights of all people. I have people. supported the okay. ER. That moment right there was so strong. That's going to bring Joe Biden down potentially in the polls substantially. All the other candidates should send Kamala a thank you card because she may have just single-handedly taken down a frontrunner. Now, you know, he was already starting to nosedive when it comes to polling and support. But that right there was just, that was brilliant. You've got to give her credit where it's due. That was a political maneuver that was so strong, so powerful, that I don't know how Joe Biden would have been able to respond to that. I mean, if I was instructing Joe Biden, what I would say is, you have to apologize. Don't be defensive. Don't deny. Just apologize. But He's a narcissist like Donald Trump, so he's incapable of introspection, and he would never admit to any wrongdoing. And he did that. And he was so flustered, so unable to defend himself, what he did was cut himself off. Not kidding. I agree that everybody wants they in fact, they should... Anyway, my time's up. I'm sorry. Thank you, Vice President. All of Yikes. Now, as I said in the full debate breakdown that I did, 
if you are a candidate like Joe Biden, it behooves you to not say very much, you know, because people don't like you when they hear what you have to say. So to maintain that lead, you've got to try to remain quiet most of the time. But the caveat is if you are defending yourself, you absolutely should not stop talking. You run out the clock. He cut himself off and said, I'm out of time. Embarrassing. Completely embarrassing. Kamala Harris absolutely destroyed Joe Biden. And I suspected that somebody would call him out on the stage because of his support for segregationists and his, you know, fond memories of individuals like James Eastland, who is just explicitly racist and just was a garbage person. I thought that it was possible somebody would call him out, but I wasn't sure that they would be able to do it in a way that was powerful and effective. Kamala did just that. And it wasn't just this moment that made her stand out. I mean, her performance overall was great. So she's one to look out for because regardless if you support her or not, she is a powerful debater and a great speaker. And she's going to use that to her advantage. And um, what she did here to Joe Biden was just masterful. It's something that anyone who's getting into politics should watch and study because that's how you take down a political behemoth. You call them on their bullshit and you leave them in a position where they're so damaged that they can't defend themselves. Kirsten Gillibrand, towards the second half of night two of the first Democratic Party primary debate, she really started to shine and speak up. And she spoke about corruption in such an articulate way, an impressive way, that I wanted to spotlight it. The reason why the Trump tax cut had to be passed is because they had to pay back their donors. You heard it. They actually said those words. So the corruption in Washington is real. And it is something that makes every one of the plans we've heard about over the last several months impossible. And I have the most comprehensive approach to do it with clean elections, publicly fund elections. So we restore the power of our democracy into the hands of the voters, not into the Koch brothers. We were talking about issues. Imagine, we're in Florida, imagine the Parkland kids having as much power in our democracy Thank as you. the Koch brothers or the NRA. Thank imagine you, their Koch voices Thank carrying you. farther and wider than Thank anyone you. else because Senator their voice Koch. is needed. Senator and Gillibrand, even, I'm trying to get everybody president, in here. It's the first thing Thank I'm going to do because nothing else is possible, whether I, it's education or health care or ending institutional Thank racism. you very much. So this is great. She's persuasive here. Everything she's saying is 100% on point. But here's the issue that I have with Kirsten Gillibrand. She's one of those candidates who she talks the talk, but she's not walking the walk. She talks about money in politics. And then one of her first acts as a presidential candidate was to go to a fundraiser that was thrown for her by the executive of a big pharma company, Sally Sussman of Pfizer. And her excuse, well, she's a friend and, uh, you know, she supports me because uh, I support LGBTQ rights. That's a poor excuse. If you know about how big of an issue money in politics is and you know how corrosive money is as a force in our democracy, why would you do that? Why would you do that? So it's odd to see her, of all people, talk this strongly and intelligently about the issue of money in politics. I would expect someone like Kamala Harris, who also I think is not a true progressive, however you want to interpret that, but you know she's a latecomer when it comes to issues like Medicare for All, but I'd expect her to really use this issue to her advantage. But what Kirsten Gillibrand has done is kind of carve out her own lane here, and I think the way she's pitching this is, look, corruption is... It's everywhere in the system. It's incredibly prevalent. So I proposed a bill that eliminates all corruption. Get money out of politics. So you don't have to worry about me doing these fundraisers, presumably, because we should worry about that. So, you know, she's saying the right things here. The problem is she just needs to talk the talk, right? And, uh, or, I, <laughs> let me rephrase that. She needs to walk the walk <laughs> and not just talk the talk. Oh, <laughs> Because she is, you know, she talks a good game. Um, now, the problem is, I don't think that people will be as perceptive as people who are as savvy as, you know, someone who would seek out a political podcast 
like this one. You're not going to know if you're just tuning in that she's not the real deal, that she attends these fundraisers with big pharma executives. You're just going to think, oh, that makes sense. I think there's too much money in politics. What she's saying makes sense to me. You won't know that she only recently stopped taking corporate PAC money. Doesn't say anything about these private fundraisers. Um, attends them herself. So, you know, this is this is an issue. However, I still want to commend her because positive reinforcement is important and I am a believer in giving credit where it's due. And even if we can't necessarily believe what she's saying, at least she's talking about this in a way that's correct and in a way that ultimately will do what we want. We'll shift the Overton window to the left and get more people to talk about this policy or in this way. And that matters. There were a lot of highlights from the second night of the first Democratic Party debate. When it comes to Bernie Sanders, I think he was the strongest on Medicare for all. He had a phenomenal closing statement and he got his message across and did enough to maintain his position in the current field. But what I was hoping he would do is kind of start to take the gloves off. And I think, you know, a couple months down the line, he's going to really have to be more forceful. But one area that got my attention was when he started to call out Joe Biden for um, basically being a warmonger. Joe Biden is functionally in alignment with a lot of neoconservatives. He's not as bad as someone like Joe, John Bolton, um, but he's still... He voted for the Iraq war. He was part of the administration that turned Libya into a failed state. So Bernie Sanders hit him on this. He didn't hit him as hard as I would have liked, but it was still a great moment. You voted for the Iraq war. You have since said you regret that vote. But why should voters trust your judgment when it comes to making a decision about taking the country to war the next time? Because once, we, once Bush abused that power, what happened was we got elected after that. I made sure the president turned to me and said, Joe, get our combat troops out of Iraq. I was responsible for getting 150,000 combat troops out of Iraq, and my son was one of them. I also think we should not have combat troops in Afghanistan. It's long overdue. It should end. And I thirdly, I believe that you're not going to find anybody who has pulled together more of our alliances to deal with what is the real stateless threat out there. We cannot go it alone in terms of dealing with terrorism. So I'd eliminate the, the, uh, the, the, the act that allowed us to go into war and not the AUMF and make sure that it could only be used for what its intent was, what its intent was, and that is to go after terrorists, but never do it alone. That's why we have to repair our alliances. We put together 65 countries to make, make sure we dealt with ISIS in Iraq and other places. That's what I would do. That's what I have done, and I know how to do it. Senator Sanders, 30 but seconds. One of, the differences, one of the differences that Joe and I have in our record is Joe voted for that war. I helped lead the opposition to that war, which is a total disaster. Second of all, I helped lead the effort for the first time to utilize the War Powers Act to get the United States out of the Saudi-led intervention in Yemen, which is the most horrific humanitarian disaster on Earth. And thirdly, let me be very clear, I will do everything I can to prevent a war with Iran, which would be far worse than disastrous war with Senator Iraq. Sanders, thank you. So that's what I want to see from Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has the credibility, unlike any other candidate, to where he absolutely can brag about his phenomenal record. He has the best record out of anyone in politics, hands down. So you have a right, you've earned the right to brag. And with bragging comes, you know, this acceptance that you can call out the candidates who aren't as good as you. And calling out Biden here was phenomenal. Now, since we're on the topic of foreign policy, Bernie Sanders did really great here in talking about foreign policy. And he boasted about his foreign policy credentials in a way that I think was really important. Um, he needed to say this because a lot of people say that Bernie just isn't effective and he proposes all of these policies, but they never get passed. And what he did in this debate was he said, this is what I have accomplished. This is what I just accomplished. He brought up Yemen and he did a great job. So overall, just a bright spot, you know, for all of you brothers of the Bernard, um, Bernard brothers, whatever we're calling ourselves nowadays, um, he did a great job. His performance was very solid, and it's why I think he was one of the winners of this debate. He's going to have to turn up the heat a little bit next time. 
Um, but for now, I think he did good enough. And I think that calling out Joe Biden is absolutely the correct strategy. You have to dunk on the front runner. Otherwise, that front runner will maintain that status. But if you all agree that we've got to bring down the front runner, then nobody's going to be singled out as someone who is being overly aggressive or overly hostile or vindictive. So I think that Bernie should have not played as nice. However, still, the fact that he um, called out Biden here, it mattered. And it was really one of the highlights of the debate for me. Well, that's all that I've got for you guys today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far, as usual, I want to thank all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping the show to not just survive, but thrive as well. You guys are absolutely amazing, and you are incredible. Also, shout out to all of our iTunes and uh, SoundCloud listeners. So, I will see you all next week. I'm Mike Figueredo. This is the Humanist Report. Uh, I don't think I have anything special planned for our 200th episode because I'm just not that creative. I exhaust all of my creativity on what I'm already doing. So unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be, a, you know, an extraordinary episode or anything like that. But nonetheless, it's still a really big milestone. You know, four years of the podcast and um, 200 episodes. That's certainly something that is, uh, I guess, you know, I could be proud of. So either way, I'll see you all next week. Take care. I'm Mike Figueredo. This has been the Humanist Report Podcast.